for uh, this time. We are here to discuss a very important agreement uh, which was reached on the 17th of June by the WTO. And in fact, uh, this is the second only multilater multilateral agreement reached by the WTO after its uh, existence in uh, 1995. <clears throat> the first one being the TRIPS agreement, you know, and uh, there are a number of uh, important things to this first to this uh, agreement because th uh, with this agreement, it is claimed that uh, uh, the, uh, the first sustainable development goal has been fully met, you know, and it is also the only sustainable development goal target uh, uh, target that has been met through multilateral through a multilateral agreement, and uh, you know the this agreement is very significant for two reasons. First one is that uh, for the last several years we have been discussing depletion of fish stock through overfishing, etc., and so on. So we need to have some kind of an agreement, and this uh, depletion to a certain extent was uh, uh, contributed by subsidies to fisheries. OK, so need to control the subsidies and through that process, uh, control the depletion of uh, fish stock. This is the argument. OK, and uh, so from that point of view, I think this is the first agreement which the WTO has reached or anything to do with environment. It has not none of the other WTO agreements uh, ha has anything to do. For instance, the TRIPS agreement has nothing to do with uh, uh, the environment as such. OK. And uh, second is the first agreement on ocean sustainability as well. And for Kerala, this is extremely important because, as we know, marine products export is our largest export item. And our estimate is something of the region of about 2,000 crores uh, uh, per, uh, uh, per year. And no, I'm sorry, about 6,000 crores uh, per year. You know, this can be a slight underestimate, but uh, by and large, 6,000 crores is the total amount of marine products exports uh, from here. And a large number of people are depending on this for their livelihood, employment, etc. and so on. So I think it is extremely important that this agreement on uh, fisheries, which has been fishery subsidies, which has been reached at the WTO, is discussed and all its uh, pros and cons uh, laid on the table. Now, uh, this is organized by my colleague, uh, Professor Harilal, and he has put together a very interesting set of people to talk about this. So we have presentations first, first by an economist, uh, Professor Bishu Jibdar. Now, Professor Dar is a uh, professor of economics at the uh, Center for Economic Studies and Planning at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU. Uh, the Center for Economic Studies and Planning is the Department of Economics of uh, JNU. Okay. Yeah. Now, professor Dar has worked previously as the Director General of the Research and Information System for Developing countries, RIS. Okay, it has got a big name, but I have shortened it up to RIS. And then before that, he was also a professor and head of the Center for WTO Studies at the Indian Institute of Foreign Trade. He has long years of experience working at looking at trade agreements, intellectual property rights, uh, and 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 so on. And so I think he's the right person to talk about uh, the agreement on fishery subsidies. Uh, and he has been also writing in a Apart from scholarly pieces in uh, journals, chapters and books, etc., he also writes very regularly popular articles in the Hindu. Okay, so very warm welcome to Professor Dar. He is not new to CDS, but again, virtually again, and I, I, I and he's going to come back in in person uh, later in the month of uh, November uh, for another conference. Okay, a and uh, the second person that we have here is a very distinguished alumnus of the center. Uh, Mr. Sebastian Matthew. Uh, he's also an economist by training, but he's now the uh, executive director at the Secretariat of the International Collective in, in uh, for uh, fish support, uh, in support of fish workers. Okay. And he has also been writing and uh, <coughs> working on, on this aspects for a very long period of time. I believe about for about uh, three decades. I think. I, I think so. Okay. Uh, and so, a very warm welcome to Sebastian also to this uh, discussion. And now I will call upon my colleague, Professor Hari Lal, who is the organizer of this uh, discussion, to introduce the discussants. We have about five discussants who are essentially drawn from the, you know, uh, from the industry, but we also have uh, at least one person there who, who is both an academic as well as an activist uh, and, and so on. So I think uh, 
Over to you, Professor Harila. Uh, Suril, I'll introduce uh, discussions uh, as and when uh, I call upon yes. them. Okay. Uh, okay. So if, if you if you want to say something more by way of introduction, you finish, and then uh, uh, no, I, I I think I have said enough. I, I think maybe we can call uh, yeah. Professor Dot to make his presentation. You know. Yeah. Before that, let me uh, make some statement regarding. Um, uh, rules of uh, the the current discussion. We we'll love uh, two presentations, one by Professor Vishudhar and uh, the second one by Sebastian Matthew. And uh, uh, we we are assuming that now they will be able to make the presentations taking around fifteen to twenty minutes. Maximum will be twenty minutes. Uh, of course, you know, it will be very difficult to uh, express everything in twenty minutes. But now. Uh, whatever is left now can be done uh, when we have QA sessions uh, later. Now, after that, we have the discussion uh, and uh, discussions. Uh, I think you know they can take uh, five to ten minutes uh, for discussing this uh, uh, agreement and uh, making certain observations about uh, the presentations. Uh, as moderator. I'm not supposed to get into the agreement and uh, different positions. Positions, certainly, we are going to listen from Professor Dha and uh, uh, Sebastian. And then, of course, uh, our discussions will be joining and adding their uh, views on the agreement. Uh, I'll just uh, mention one uh, possible impact. Uh, we are, uh, uh, in fact, you know, uh, there will be a problem regarding subsidies. Subsidies will have to be removed in most countries, and uh, and uh, the agreement covers most types of uh, subsidies. And uh, I think uh, the presentations will uh, explain why uh, most subsidies will be covered by uh, this agreement. Now, uh, my focus, which I thought. Uh, um, uh, uh, will have to be specifically mentioned in the in the introduction itself. That is about uh, the compliance costs uh, at the level of governments uh, in India, for example, union government and state government, and uh, compliance costs for individual operators. It is going to be substantial, and in fact, no, that is going to overshadow even the subsidy issue. That's my worry. Because uh, to have a regulatory mechanism for millions of boats in uh, developing countries to register them, to track them, not for once for all, but almost every day kind of tracking will be extremely costly. And who will bear the cost? And uh, that cost will have to be borne by the union government and uh, the state government. Apart from that, of course, individual operators will have to we we'll love to report on a on a uh, regular basis, and that will be very costly for our traditional fish folk. Uh, this is one uh, dimension which uh, uh, generally we may overlook because you now we will get into subsidies and uh, arguments related to this. But cost of complaints for government of India, India, which will be it will be much more much more than uh, a real subsidy expenditure if it is there. Uh, in fact, when I was speaking to Charles George, he was, men he was asking me whether we are really subsidizing. Are we not having negative subsidies in the fishing sector? Because now, if you take uh, petroleum prices and taxes and international prices, compare our domestic prices with international prices, maybe you know, we will end up uh, arriving at negative figures as far as subsidy is concerned. That's also a point. In, uh, but generally, I just wanted to mention about the transaction costs and uh, the compliance costs which will be falling on the governments of third world countries. With this uh, few words, I'm uh, ending. Uh, I'll have uh, certain positions which, uh, which I'll certainly explain towards the end when we conclude the uh, discussions. Now let me call upon uh, Professor Bishwajitha to make his uh, presentation. Professor Dhar. Uh, 
Thank you, Sunil, and uh, thank you, uh, Arilal. It's always a pleasure to be uh, part of the discussions in CDS, and it's all so very enriching. Can you see my screen, please? Yes, yes. Uh, yes screen, okay. screen, no, you can be seen, but share. Uh -huh. Oh, you can't. Okay, let me see. Uh, yeah, share, share it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, is, is it now is it now visible? Yeah, yeah, it's coming. Yeah, okay. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be with all of you. Uh, and you know, Harilal and I have been discussing about this uh, uh, the, the the fisheries subsidies agreement. Uh, the fact that uh, we need to have a proper discussion on this. And what better place to have this discussion than CDS, you know, where a lot of these discussions have taken place in the past. I've also, uh, you know, you know, been uh, been participant, not directly, but of course indirectly. And uh, now, since the agreement is there in front of us, I think we need to make an assessment as to where we are vis-a-vis -vis this, this agreement. Now, there have been a lot of uh, talk about this agreement. The first thing is that uh, the government of India. Uh, seems to be rather pleased having done this agreement. Uh, and uh, uh, my first reaction was uh, one of surprise because still uh, the first week of June, at least this is something that is known, you know, uh, officially, uh, India was very unhappy with whatever was happening in the fisheries subsidies agreement. There was a, an informal uh, paper by India. I think the date is 6th, 6th of June. Where a number of concerns were expressed, and I'll, I'll reflect on some of the concerns here as well uh, about uh, the, the direction in which this fisheries subsidies agreement was going. So between six and you know sort of twelve, when things really got uh, uh, packaged, uh, you know what really went, uh, what really held, uh, you know, was uh, was different for the government of India to feel so enthusiastic about it. Now, now that's where uh, the problem actually begins because uh, we have seen this in the past as well that you know there have been such tremendous pressure from the advanced countries, and at the end of the day, uh, you know somehow we uh, are not able to express our resentment so so uh, so uh, in an uh, expressed manner, uh, and uh, so uh, we accept something that is unacceptable and yet try to sort of make it appear that uh, we didn't lose out. Uh, I would think that that's really not a proper strategy because also in this case of fiscal subsidies, a lot is left to be done. And if we say that we are happy with this agreement, then I think in the in the in the in due course, when the substantive uh, negotiations take place, we could be in uh, in in real trouble. So without any uh, further ado, let me just uh, uh, you know sort of my present what I have to say. Uh, I just gave a brief background as to where this agreement has come from. This issue was actually raised by the US in 1997. And uh, the, the argument for removal of the subsidies was something that we have all, we are all been, been we are very familiar with. Uh, something that, uh, you know, the, the fund bank and the, the advanced countries have been saying all the, all the time. The subsidies are actually bad, irrespective of how you use it. And uh, this is something that uh, it, uh, an issue where we have had serious problems because the subsidies, we all know that there are kinds and kinds of subsidies. There are subsidies for uh, livelihoods, food security, and other things, something that uh, the, the, we are expecting the fishermen, fishermen to fisher folk to get. Uh, and there are the other kinds of market distorting and subsidies which the big, big guys get. Uh, uh, so, uh, so these, uh, uh, with this background, you know, the discussions actually uh, uh, proceeded and the mandate for the negotiations came in the Doha round and uh, in the Doha ministerial conference and they were very clear, too clear, uh, for, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, the sets of uh, uh, the mandate had two really, really clear points. The first was to clarify and improve disciplines of fishery subsidies, taking into account the importance of this sector to developing countries. So let us not forget that the mandate clearly said that the developing country interest should be there. And then uh, 
the mandate mandate uh, was under the topic of trade and environment, something that Sunil just mentioned. This was the first time that an environment related issue was introduced in the WTO as a, uh, as a, a negotiating item. You know, earlier, you know, in um, uh, the other areas of environment it was happening in a kind of a discussion mode, but this was in a in a more of a negotiating mode. The Hong Kong Ministerial Conference clarified this again, strengthening the, the, the point that uh, special and differential treatment to, to developing countries and least developed countries should be an integral part of the fisheries subsidies negotiations. And, and again, taking into account the importance of the sector to development priorities, poverty reduction and livelihood. So what I'm in, insisting is that uh, the, the, the mandate clearly talked about SND and, and, and why I'm emphasizing this, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll understand uh, in course of uh, my presentation. Now, FAO had, was, had uh, contributed uh, uh, richly to this, uh, this, this uh, uh, the debate, where uh, actually uh, I uh, talked about uh, the need to pre the prevent, detect, eliminate illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, what we call IUUs. Uh, and uh, so uh, the, the technical kind of, or the rationale was given also by the FAO. Uh, and, uh, and, and negotiate nego negotiations actually got strengthened, and you can see that it, uh, the Doha, Doha, Doha mandate came immediately after this. The SDGs reinforced this again. Again, here, if you see the second bullet, it said that appropriate and effective special and differential treatment for developing countries and least developed countries should be an integral part of the World Trade Organization fisheries subsidies negotiation. Now. Uh, so when you look at the agreement, uh, uh, you know you'll you'll find that there are there are the, the major provisions are the following. There's a definition of subsidies, the subsidies contributing to the IUUs, and uh, then uh, subsidies regarding overfish stock, uh, and the other subsidies. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm not going to be comparing what happened earlier with uh, the with the previous drafts that will take a long time. And there are specific provisions for LDC members. And and then there is a very curious provision, the last provision, the last article on termination of the agreement if comprehensive disciplines are not adopted, uh, and, and in four years it has these have to be adopted. And there and this has a particular connotation for India as well. Now the definition of subsidies uh, uh, is uh, the the definition adopted is uh, uh, the other that uh, the only specific subsidies are included. The subsidies provided to marine while capture fishing and fishing related activities. So the only specific subsidies according to the agreement on subsidies and contributing uh, measures. There's a whole bunch of subsidies which lie beyond this, which are called the non specific subsidies. Now those are completely excluded. And uh, there were only some reference to non specific subsidies to the earlier draft. Uh, and uh, uh, it talked about the non specific sub fuel subsidies, but then beyond fuel subsidies also there are a bunch of uh, non non specific subsidies now uh, so what are non specific subsidies now there's a lot of ambiguity so if you look at the wto law and practice you know what has happened to the jurisprudence in terms of the um, the uh, you know the different uh, uh, disputes what the disputes have said said there is complete ambiguity about what are non specific subsidies um, and uh, you know uh, like a term that we use often in the in case of international diplomacy uh, can be said from the point of view of the developed countries who use these non-specific subsidies, uh, uh, it's actually constructive ambiguity because they want to use these non-specific subsidies. So uh, the criteria that the, the, uh, the agreement on subsidies and contributing measures uh, says that this is, you can see this, this is, this is neither here nor there. This has to be an objective criteria or conditions governing the eligibility for and the amount of subsidy. A specificity, a specificity shall not exist. So they are not specific subsidies. They are not targeted subsidies given to certain entities, certain industries, or certain firms. Other than that, everything is non-specific. Yeah, and and then the WTO jurisprudence very uh, curiously said that uh, it's often commented on the appearance of non-specificity. Now, I don't understand how, you know, just on the appearance of a subsidy being non-specific, uh, you can make a distinction between uh, uh, specific and non-specific subsidies. So my point is that this agreement actually leaves out a whole range of subsidies which are beyond, uh, you know, it's not covered 
uh, the, uh, in the segment and 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 then that could be uh, something uh, to look forward to and india in its 6 june paper actually raised this yes, hello can i uh, please go ahead yeah yeah so in 6 june paper india actually raised concerns regarding the exclusion of non specific subsidies and there are a number of things that they said that you know that when you look at the mandate uh, the sustainability of of fish fish uh, the of fish stocks from an environmental perspective the scope of prohibition of subsidies cannot be limited to the market distorting distortion principle of specific subsidies now we know this too well from the agreement on agriculture how this can actually pan out uh, and then uh, the mandates uh, given in the SDGs also do not make any distinction between specific and non-specific subsidies. They talk about subsidies in general. Uh, and then, of course, SDGs have a caveat for the developing country uh, you know, concerns. And, and then again, India says that there is no evidence to show that non-specific fuel subsidies are either less harmful or not, or not harmful and do not contribute to overcapacity or overfishing. So in short, India's actually, uh, you know, raised the alarm bells and also showed that, you know, the total subsidies, uh, fisheries subsidies around 22% is actually non-specific fuel subsidies. Now, this is there before the agreement came in. Now, after the agreement uh, 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 has come in, this number could actually increase. And I'm drawing lessons from the agreement on agriculture. Uh, uh, so uh, there are further issues on, on non-specific subsidies. Because as, as as I can see, it, it can be like the green box subsidies in agriculture, which the developed countries have used to the hill. And this is what I was I'm saying that if before the agreement is coming, we have 22 percent going into non-specific subsidies. After the agreement comes in, like we have seen in agriculture, U.S. and the EU have just uh, increased the green box support uh, quite considerably. Uh, that could be a problem. Uh, now, additional problem is that agreement on agriculture specifies green box. What are green box subsidies? Agreement on fisheries subsidies doesn't talk about that. Uh, maybe we will get some clarity when the substantive negotiations happen in the next four years. Now, there are these provisions relating to uh, you know subsidies which cannot be given for IUUs. Uh, there is one clause which says the developing countries can use this subsidy for two years and up to the EZs. Now, this has been seen as a big, very big gain for for us. I don't see how you can because he, the 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 marine uh, marine life in the EZ was already our property. So there was no content contention about it. Uh, and uh, of course, the developed countries had had uh, had uh, you know sort of uh, muddied the waters by uh, bringing in other criteria as well. And for two years, we can't use it. For so after two years, there is no SND. Similarly, for overfish stocks. Uh, you know, uh, it, this says that, you know, fish stock is and uh, it's uh, uh, fish stock is overfished if it is recognized as overfished by the coastal member under whose jurisdiction the fishing is taking place. So the, the onus is on India and uh, a relevant regional fisheries management organization arrangement in the area. So, so the, 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 the ball is on our court, something that Harilal was mentioning about the cost of compliance. So identifying overfish stock can be contentious. It can also result in disputes and a lot of uncertainties and un uncertainties can come in because of the fact that these have not been clarified. The definitions are not there clearly and the onus is on us. And here again, like the case of IOUs, subsidies granted for overfish stocks can be uh, for developing countries. Uh, developing countries can grant them for two years and in their AEZ. Uh, again, you know, this is the best we have we have in terms of the SND. Now there are other subsidies as well, and no, and here I'll just flag the second uh, uh, point, which says that uh, a member shall take special care and exercise due restraint when granting subsidies to fishing or fishing related activities regarding stocks, the status of which is unknown. Again, Harilal's point that you know the compliance issues is going to really. Uh, coming very strongly here, the implementation is going to be really problematic. Yeah, uh, uh, now, this um, uh, the Article 12, uh, termination of the agreement if comprehensive disciplines are not adopted. So this says that if comprehensive disciplines are not adopted within four years of the entry into force of this agreement, it's going to come in very soon, 
this agreement shall stand immediately terminated. So, you know, uh, 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 some people who are not understanding the whole import of this would say that, okay, you know, if this comprehensive disciplines are not uh, implemented or adopted within four years, this fishery subsidies agreement is going, going to go off the table. But that's not the case. The point is that this, this uh, article is being used to put pressure on India. And as you know, India was the only country which was arguing for small fishermen and it had actually delayed, quote unquote, the adoption of this agreement for a number of years. Yeah. Uh, uh, and of course, the pro problem with India is that we have now an agreement here which doesn't have special and differential treatment. And for India, it will be impossible to accept comprehensive disciplines without the SND treatment. So India is going to be out there, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, stalling the negotiations, but India cannot stall it indefinitely because if it goes, stalling goes beyond four years, then the responsibility of, of, uh, of uh, finishing this agreement or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, or uh, 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 the um, fact that uh, the fishery subsidies agreement is not going to be valid is going to be fairly and squarely on India. So, like Sunil was mentioning, that this is only the second agreement which has been adopted in the WTO or since the WTO has come into existence. So, there has been a lot of uh, celebration about it, and India can't be seen to be sort of be a country which is which is which is uh, the uh, you know, putting a standard in these uh, celebrations and, and negotiations and SND, we all know, can be very uh, contentious. And uh, uh, so, so that's the problem. Finally, I would flag this as the most important and the critical issue in the special subsidies agreement, because this is the first yeah, agreement adopted by the WTO without an explicit SND for developing countries. And even for the uh, uh, LDCs, the provisions are extremely hollow. Now, excluding SND, I think many of us understand the implications of extremely dangerous proceedings mm -hmm. because the developed countries, advanced countries have proposed reforming the WTO, quote unquote, by excluding SND provisions. India and China have been targeted to begin with. And, and, and my concern is that SND could be eliminated or at best significantly watered down in the future decisions. So I think, you know, this is this uh, fishery subsidies agreement is like a Trojan horse and it's, 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 it's going to do uh, uh, significant harm to the entire architecture of the WTO uh, in this, in this uh, in the present, present shape it, it, it is in. And it's very important for us uh, to raise our concerns over this agreement, to insist on the government of India that Whatever has been written in Article 12, India should not data. We should not actually, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, be afraid of, 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 of breaking consensus or, or doing anything uh, which doesn't actually help the WTO take its mandate forward. After all, WTO is going to is following a mandate that is ex that is extremely problematic for developing countries. And I think if India uh, 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 puts the spanners in the works is going to do a whole lot of good for the developing world. So I'll, I'll end, end at that and uh, any questions and clarifications, I'll be happy to uh, uh, respond. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Bishwajit. Uh, I think uh, all of us will agree with you that uh, we should consider the agreement on fisheries in the context of our experience of earlier agreements and the track record of uh, implementation. And you specifically mentioned the agreement on agriculture yeah. and uh, the green box and uh, the concerns, your concerns regarding the, uh, the, uh, the, the non-specific subsidies uh, is very important. We will have to really discuss, in, uh, discuss this in detail not necessarily in this uh, meeting of uh, uh, today's meeting, but uh, subsequently, uh, because uh, the experience of uh, green box and blue box, we know very well. And we know the negotiations uh, at later stages can take turns, which will be against uh, people who are 
having less uh, bargaining power. So um, I hope uh, uh, many of these points which you which you flagged off will be discussed. Uh, but there is one question which I would like to mention briefly. Uh, as uh, Professor Sunil mentioned, one major goal of this agreement is to check overfishing, to uh, to uh, protect uh, resources. How exactly is this agreement going to uh, serve that uh, basic goal in which you know, we are all interested in? And uh, if specific subsidies and other loopholes are there, uh, what will happen to big uh, uh, ships and other major capital which is operating? Uh, that's also very important. Now, uh, let me invite uh, Sri Sebastian Matthew to make his presentation. Sebastian. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Harilal, and thank you, uh, uh, Professor Mani, for inviting uh, us to this event. And uh, I think uh, uh, the presentation of uh, Professor Dar from JNU is uh, very uh, enlightening. Uh, I think uh, uh, I would like to uh, uh, contextualize um, fisheries uh, subsidies uh, uh, issues, uh, and then. In, in light of uh, what is the status of uh, fisheries development in uh, in the developing countries, and then to see if uh, we can see this uh, agreement as a catalyst for resource management. So that is the uh, perspective that I am taking on this agreement. So I would like to uh, share my screen. Yeah, you can see my screen. Yeah. 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 We thank can you. See. So, um, so firstly, I want to uh, uh, put the uh, marine capture fisheries uh, of uh, developing countries in context, because uh, it's very important to know that um, the uh, uh, world marine uh, capture fisheries production uh, actually peaked in 1996, is now nearly 24 years. And uh, even the most recent figures, which got published about two weeks ago, it's about uh, about 80 million tons uh, from FAO. And uh, if you look at the share of uh, developing countries uh, in marine uh, capture fisheries, it is now 65%. So two thirds of uh, 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 capture fisheries production worldwide, marine capture fisheries production is coming from developing countries. And then if you look at the top 10 uh, marine capture fisheries uh, uh, countries in the world, you can see that five uh, are from developing countries, China, Indonesia, Peru, uh, India, and Vietnam. And then if you look at fishing fleet, again, the latest figures show that uh, uh, two thirds of uh, the world fishing fleet uh, are, in, are in Asia and 22% uh, in Africa. And then in terms of employment, uh, nearly 80% are employed in Asia and about 13% uh, you know, in Africa. Uh, and then if you look at exports uh, of aquatic products, uh, in fact, uh, from 2020, FAO has moved from seafood exports to a new term called aquatic products. So you can see that, uh, you know, uh, capture fisheries uh, for 54 percent by quantity and 52 percent by value is coming from developing countries. Uh, excuse me, Sebastian. Yeah. Uh, Professor Vishayad is saying that uh, uh, he's requesting you to move to presentation. Because so he's saying that the right. screen is not visible. You can see the screen. Can you yeah. see now? Please, 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 uh, go, go, uh, you know, uh, go on to the presentation mode. Ah. It's in the presentation mode. Ah, okay, one second. No, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, can you see it now? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So then if you look at the uh, uh, top 10 uh, exporters of uh, aquatic products, you see that uh, China is 12%, Vietnam is 5%, uh, India is 4%, and Thailand 4%. So you can see that uh, uh, top five of the top exporters are from, from the developing world. And then um, uh, if you look at the status of marine fish stocks, um, so many stocks are kind of uh, uh, overfished. They include uh, shrimp, grouper, sardines, you know, uh, from uh, all the uh, continents, Africa, Asia, Latin America. Uh, and the share of uh, unsustainable uh, stocks increased from 10% in 1974 to 35.4% in 2019. So there's a major increase in that. So even in India, uh, if you look at some recent publication, you can see that 
34% of the stocks are sustainable. Sebastian Matthew, you are muted now, please unmute. We can't hear you. Can you hear now, so, Headland? Yeah, yeah, now, but be louder. So if you see that uh, uh, in India also, 36% uh, uh, of resources are overfished. So this is uh, according to a recent uh, study by uh, scientists from Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute. So what is interesting in this uh, table is that uh, when 36% are overfished, 3% uh, are in overfishing status. So therefore, the time taken between uh, moving from uh, overfishing to overfish status is very, very short in India. So therefore, in a tropical uh, multi very important. Yeah. Uncontrolled uh, increasing fishing effort uh, is behind the poor status of Indian fish stocks. So therefore, the, the point I'm trying to make is have to talk about a common approach to uh, conservation and uh, Sebastian, I think, you know, we can't hear you because you know, you're moving, moving maybe uh, quite a lot. You know, you'll have to be stable probably. I don't know um, the technicality. I don't know, but uh, yeah, what about others? Uh, is it audible to others? No, it is not. Uh, no, uh, no, it's not audible. Uh, I, I think uh, now you're audible, but you have to come problem to yeah, yeah. When you move away, it is not audible. That's a problem. No, we are, you are not audible even now. Not audible now. You are not at all audible. Uh, now we can hear you. Oh, yeah, okay, so I think that sound uh, is it better, or you should I speak louder, or uh, I think we can hear you. We can hear yeah, you. Okay. Yeah, now it's yeah. okay. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So then uh, uh, I would like to uh, again reiterate the point uh, that uh, that uh, we need uh, when we talk about uh, uh, resource management uh, in the marine sector. We should talk about a, a common responsibility, a common approach to uh, conservation and management, not common but differentiated approach. Can, can you hear now? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Very much. So <clears throat> therefore, you know, I, I think. Uh, no. Oh, sorry. Now also you are out of range. Yeah, yeah. Nothing is audible. Hello. Is it audible or? Yeah, yeah. Now it's now it's audible. Oh, I think it's sort of uh, fluctuating actually. Yeah. Yeah. So um, when I go uh, to the full, uh, I think uh, display mode. I think it is having some problem with audio. Okay. Now whatever is convenient uh, for you, you can uh, shift to that mode. If you don't want to show the Slides. In fact, now we have shared your slides to everybody. Hello. 
بس Can you hear me now? Yes, Sebastian. Yeah, is it better now without the uh, without the? Uh, yeah, it's better now. It's better now. Okay, I think there is some problem. So then. Now we can't hear you again. Uh, I. I uh, I, I think maybe you could uh, switch on to your mobile phone. Uh, you should you you should log out of this completely. Otherwise, it will start hooting. You know, uh, if two connections are wrong. From your email uh, inbox, in yeah, yeah. Uh, you can get to, get the link to this. flagging a kind of a situation which is ma mainly between say uh, Europe and Africa but not necessarily relevant for India but then uh, we have to uh, exercise uh, due restraint uh, granting subsidies to uh, fishing uh, stocks of uh, unknown status that which is also referred to so therefore you know resource estimate uh, stock estimate would be important before these subsidies are granted and then it we come to uh, the, the the red category that subsidies cannot be granted to a vessel or an operator in IUU fishing. So therefore saying that it's not that subsidies cannot be granted. They're saying that sub subsidies cannot be granted for IUU fishing. And then they're saying that uh, subsidies cannot be given for an overfish stock. And then saying that subsidies cannot be given for fishing outside the jurisdiction of a coastal state. So therefore, uh, I would like to see this in a, in a traffic light approach. So when you come to the the uh, red subsidies, so what are the subsidies uh, when we talk about IUU fishing? I think uh, basically uh, we have to talk about uh, fishing without permission. And if, if you don't take permission to fish, that is illegal fishing. If it is a violation of uh, the uh, national laws and regulations, it is illegal fishing or the regulations of a regional fisheries body. And then unreported fishing is when you do not report uh, your uh, you know, fishing activity or catches to the authorities. Uh, and then unregulated fishing is when, uh, when you fish for stocks uh, where there are no applicable uh, conservation and management measures. I mean, an example for India would be the exclusive economic zone. So then um, if you look at IUU fishing and subsidies, uh, uh, subsidies are contingent upon taking permission to fish subject to reporting catches and complying with conservation and management measures. So if you do these things, then you can give subsidies to the fishing vessels or to the operator. 
So therefore, uh, the conditions are to be met before we can consider granting subsidies to the sector. And then, uh, as uh, uh, this is also pointed out, the onus is on the coastal state. I think which is a good thing that the onus is on the coastal state, which means the state in responsible for the resources. And the flag state, which is flying the flag, if it is if you're going outside uh, uh, one country to another country, uh, India is a flag state, say Indian vessels going to Seychelles or into uh, Sri Lanka, for example. And then uh, we have to make the affirmative determination that, you know, if a vessel is making uh, engaged in IUU fishing and if the coastal state is not making an affirmative de determination, I think no one can challenge uh, of the decision, the decision of the coastal state. And if you look at uh, the uh, uh, list of uh, 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 in, uh, IUU fishing vessels of in Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, uh, in fact, I was looking at the most uh, recent figures. It shows that there are five Indian longliners are on the Indian Ocean Tuna Line uh, Commission's IUU vessels list. So therefore, this uh, type of vessels may be are not eligible for uh, uh, benefiting from subsidies. But then if, uh, uh, for example, this, uh, they also have a list called uh, Record of Authorized Vessels. There are four Indian longliners on that on that list, so these vessels uh, can uh, fish uh, outside the Indian EZ in the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission area. So therefore, we have to see if uh, authorization of uh, Indian longliners, for example, uh, pe people catching tuna or shark, uh, can be uh, made part of the uh, the legal uh, uh, regime. And then when we talk about uh, subsidies not to be given in the areas under national jurisdiction, that is what they're saying. So this again goes from the internal waters, which are the landward side of the baseline, to the territorial sea, to the contiguous zone, to the EEZ, and then even to the continental shelf. If there are living resources on the continental shelf, those resources will also come under the uh, national jurisdiction. Therefore, we need to have a kind of a coherent uh, management framework for all these different zones. And then um, if you talk about, uh, 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 so therefore we need to therefore develop by 2024 uh, rules and regulations uh, to address uh, IUU fishing, which means uh, the, uh, the Marine Fishing Regulation Act have to be reformed, which means uh, for the EEZ, we need to have a legislation, the Indian Marine Fisheries Bill is still in the parliament, that needs to be adopted. So this uh, can help in developing rules and uh, other type of procedures to deal with uh, uh, the situation arising from uh, having no legal uh, measures that applies to fisheries. So, uh, so developing countries have, a, I think, four years time uh, under the SDP clause uh, to uh, make sure that you know their vessels are fully kind of complying with uh, IUU fishing uh, regulations. So therefore, we need to develop some kind of a legislation and policies in place uh, over the next four years time. And then when it comes to overfish stock, I mentioned that even 36% uh, uh, of Indian resources are overfish. So therefore we can see that, you know, states like Gujarat in Maharashtra, Goa, Karnataka, Kerala, all these states have uh, listed, uh, you know, uh, overfish stocks. So therefore uh, it's very important to recognize the fact that we need to also consider moving from so uh, from uh, a, a country which is in in, uh, in pursuit of developing the fisheries to a country which has to move from fisheries development to fisheries conservation and management. I think that is a, the main shift which has to take place uh, even in uh, advanced developing countries like India and China. And then um, uh, it talks about uh, the depleted. See, like for example, if you are uh, giving subsidies for rebuilding fish stocks, so there are many subsidies we can give, for example, for buyback schemes, uh, social adjustment payments. You know, if you want to uh, pay uh, saving income relief, uh, fishermen are paid not to fish. That can be a good subsidy. Uh, uh, paying to keep fishing vessels away from fishing, finding alternative species to target. Uh, you are diverting uh, fishing pressure from some stock to other stocks. Then uh, excess capacity can be uh, redeployed or they can be used for evaluating the state of fish stocks in research, in cooperative or collaborative research. And then even uh, permanent retirement of vessels can also be considered. So these are all kind of activities uh, that can be subsidized in the name of rebuilding uh, depleted fish stocks. Therefore, many of the subsidies which we perhaps are uh, uh, should consider are the this kind of subsidies for, you know, uh, in relation to resource conservation and management. And that those subsidies are, are permitted under this agreement. 
Uh, and again, uh, 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 subsidies for overfish stocks, uh, there is a SDT uh, clause for overfish stocks also. So four years we have to uh, phase out. So therefore, these kind of species which are in state of overfishing uh, or overfished can be changed. And what is interesting about uh, tropical fisheries is that we need uh, uh, not that long period of time as in, as in temperate waters. We can, uh, in five to 10 years time, this paper of uh, CMO Barre points out that we can reverse the state of fisheries. Therefore, resource management can really help to change the status of the stock to a healthy stock. Uh, and then, uh, it talks about subsidies uh, you know, outside the jurisdiction. I think here again, we have to keep in mind that many Indian vessels, uh, especially the longliners, are fishing outside, uh, sometimes in Seychelles, in British Indian Ocean Territory. In fact, the five vessels listed on IOTC are uh, apprehended in the British Indian Ocean Territory waters. So they were uh, IUU fishing in those areas. So therefore, we need to uh, develop flag state authorization measures. So this is again, once you authorize, you can definitely extend the, uh, the current kind of subsidies to those results as well. Yeah. And what I consider the most important part of the agreement is the, the notification requirement. Uh, there are two types of notification that the agreement is talking about. One is the uh, uh, general regular notification every three years under the uh, SCM agreement. Uh, and then uh, they talk about annual notification to a new committee to be created called Committee on Fisheries Subsidies, list of vessels, operators. So this kind of, uh, I think, uh, notification would require that we change our legislation and uh, rules and procedures. And then, of course, as uh, uh, Bishwis has also said, that termination of the agreement, the way I read the agreement is that the termination of the agreement will happen if one pillar which is left out uh, in the negotiation namely the pillar dealing with overcapacity and overfishing is not addressed. Because if you really talk about a comprehensive in instrument for, uh, for fishery subsidies, I think that instrument should be uh, focusing on, um, on overcapacity and overfishing pillar. And if this is not addressed, I think then the, uh, uh, the language of the agreement is that it may stand terminated uh, by 2028. So what are the implications for India? So. Uh, a few uh, points that we have uh, put together. One is that uh, we need to develop and implement rele relevant laws, uh, regulations and administrative procedures for all maritime zones of India. And then we need to do an affirmative determination of IUU fishing vessels after 2026, including for vessels that undertake uh, fishing in waters under the jurisdiction of other coastal states. So therefore that's very important to keep track of who is fishing where. And then uh, subsidies are not to be extended to fishing vessels uh, targeting overfish stocks. So therefore, to uh, re reverse the situation, we may have to make sure that the overfish stocks are brought under the resource management kind of a framework. Uh, and then uh, laws and regulations uh, for fishing undertaken by vessels in the EEZ, in the high seas, and in the waters of other coastal states. Therefore, EEZ, high seas, and uh, 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 authorization to fish outside are still out, not legislated effectively, and these need to be undertaken. And, uh, and last but not the least, we need to develop a very comprehensive fisheries management framework for the EZ and the territorial sea. So there are, you know, movement of vessels from, uh, say, Kerala to Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu to Kerala, and then um, uh, Kerala to Karnataka. Interstate movement is very, uh, very much uh, there now in the Indian fisheries. And there is also movement between the territorial sea and the EZ. So all these uh, need some kind of a legal uh, framework to address. So this legal framework has to be developed. And I think uh, the, the cost, the compliance cost of this will be high to begin with because we have not really uh, invested. If you look at uh, the, uh, the figures of uh, Indian fisheries uh, in general, uh, we have maybe spent about two or 3% of landed value of catch to, for resource management. But this, if you look at OECD countries, it goes up to 50%, five zero. So therefore, you can see that you know the very large reinvestment of uh, of uh, the landed value of the catch goes into resource management in in, in OECD countries, in developed countries, and in developing countries like India, I think it's very very underdeveloped. So therefore, this is uh, an area where which we need to uh, find resources and uh, and uh, and uh, and improve uh, the uh, performance of resource management. And uh, my uh, uh, hunch is that if you invest in resource management, 
and if you invest in value added uh, products because uh, we have to move away from uh, increasing production to supply fish to the market which anyway is now taken over by aquaculture because 56% of fish uh, for food consumption is now coming from aquaculture so we can focus on improving labor standards on fishing vessels we can focus on improving the uh, resource management uh, of the of these different fisheries and compliance with the resource management measures and then investing in value added uh, products on, on land uh, which is what many countries are doing today so that uh, and then make sure that a large large share of the value is accruing back to the the fishermen or the community so so therefore i think this is the way to to look at it uh, uh, so therefore i would see an opportunity in this agreement uh, to uh, uh, move from a development of fisheries approach to uh, a conservation and management approach which i think uh, is uh, high time that we we shifted gear and moved from that development paradigm after 1977 when we had the maritime zones of india act to 1990s so even today uh, and this definitely will will pay much greater dividend uh, in the long run yeah thank you <clears throat> Thank you, Sebastian Matthew. Uh, though we had some uh, technical difficulties, you uh, presented it very well, and things, the arguments are uh, very clear. And uh, I'm sure that uh, discussions will be responding to your your arguments. And uh, your paper uh, is already circulated, so most of them might have read the paper also. And the, uh, and the presentation also, you uh, made the points very clear. Now, um, the emphasis certainly is on uh, conservation of resources. Uh, the, the importance of conservation is shared by, uh, agreed by everybody. And, um, uh, and you think uh, that uh, the coastal countries uh, like India will have an opportunity now, given by the agreement, uh, to, to improve the the system so that our resources will be properly uh, conserved uh, i will again reiterate uh, one point which i started with that is uh, okay we, we this is an opportunity for argument's sake uh, if you take uh, opportunity to have a system to conserve our resources but it should not be uh, an opportunity for developed countries to uh, put restrictions on exports from india Imports from India to developed countries. So, in the name of non-registration of uh, vessels, boats, or in the name of uh, uh, problems in the regulatory regime that uh, the Indian <coughs> India government or provincial governments are imposing, now, that can be cited as a reason for uh, introducing trade restrictive measures. Uh, you know, these are the kind of grey issues which will have to be also discussed. Now, let me uh, invite uh, Professor John Kurian to present his views. I'll uh, briefly introduce uh, Professor John Kurian, though most of our participants will know him. Uh, he is visiting professor in Nassim Premji University now, but he was originally from uh, Sirius. He was our teacher. And uh, in the introduction, Professor Dha was saying that Sirius is known for its work in the area of fisheries, WTO and natural resources. One man mainly responsible for the legacy of CDS, contributions of CDS is Professor uh, John Kurian. And uh, in fact, on this specific issue of uh, fishery subsidy also, he has worked uh, extensively and written many interesting reports. Of course, uh, they came prior to the, the new agreement, the June agreement, 22 agreement on fishery subsidies, uh, but uh, he had written quite a lot on subsidies also, fishery subsidies also. Uh, let me invite uh, Professor Kurian to make his presentation. Um, thank you. Am I, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, thanks to CDS, uh, especially to uh, Sunil and to Harilal. <coughs> Uh, for requesting me to participate here. Uh, also to Professor Dar, who I have read extensively. In fact, even in yesterday's uh, Hindu newspaper, uh, 
uh, and to Sebastian, who has made this presentation. And of course, I'm proud of Sebastian. He was my first uh, student in CDS. Uh, I have just uh, two points to make. I don't wish to comment on the uh, presentations of Professor Dar and uh, Sebastian because they are very extensive and uh, I don't wish to repeat anything. But I will just make two main points followed by uh, some explanatory reasons why I state these two points. So my first point is that we can never discuss about WTO fisheries subsidies debate without understanding five things. One is the specifics of fish. Secondly, the importance of international trade. Thirdly, the massive amount of subsidies in the past and in the present, which have been given by industrialized countries to develop their own fisheries. Fourth is the manner in which the fishery subsidy debate has been tossed around across even the times of GATT and then after the formation of WTO. And finally, what were the trade related political realities which were at play between developed and developing countries which made for this particular uh, a result of the uh, WTO fishery subsidies. And I think Professor Dar alluded to this kind of mystery that happened between the 6th and the uh, uh, 17th of uh, June. Now, let me explain. You see, uh, fish in the sea is a fugitive resource. So its harvesting is highly flexible and mobile. And you know, it's not situated in any particular space. So it's difficult to assign property rights. And therefore, the origins of production are much more difficult to determine. And this is very different with other primary commodities, which are you know, land-based. So tracking trade becomes very complex and contentious. My second point about fish is that, particularly fish stocks in tropical waters, uh, Sebastian alluded to that. They respond very quickly to conservation and rejuvenation. So this is a point we must bear in mind. The third thing is that, you know, <clears throat> many people do not know this, but fish is the most international trade, traded, internationally traded primary commodity. As much as 35 to 37% of global fish production is traded. And this share is going to increase in the future with aquaculture production. So international trade is very important when we talk about fish. Fourthly, trade in fishery products was dominated by developed countries in the last century. But in the 21st century, this is going to change. Uh, again, this was alluded to by Sebastian with the dominance of China, uh, and countries like Indonesia and Vietnam, and to a lesser degree by India, developing countries are going to dominate trade in fishery products. Fifthly, uh, fisheries and fishing communities in the developed industrialized countries have all been highly subsidized for decades. So for their capital investment, their fuel, and even directly to equalize the income of fisher people to be equal to that of industrial workers, direct subsidies. So without subsidies, fishing communities in these countries would have remained as socio-economic outliers in their own countries. So it is subsidies which have improved the situation of fishing communities in the developed world. My sixth sub point is that the in the early GATT negotiations, in the actually in the 70s and 80s, there were tussles over the issue of fisheries. Uh, and this was between the US and uh, J Japan and uh, European countries, because they were the countries which were fishing all over the world and trading between themselves. So this controversy over fish and 
you know how you are supporting your industry and so on goes way back and it's also true that fishery subsidies debate has been used by countries as a bargaining chip to get other deals and benefits so whenever there was a complexity you know this was uh, fishery subsidies was then say for example in the agreement on agriculture it included fisheries but when it became difficult to negotiate that they removed it so you know the agreement on agriculture would not have passed when it when it did pass if the issue of fisheries was not removed from it so you see that this has been happening in in many contexts and finally on this first sub point on this first main point you see india never exhibited any serious interest in fishery subsidies debates until the doha round and so the question becomes why was it so inflexible in its uh, uh ministry in this uh, geneva uh, meeting you know uh, other countries even made comments that you know this is unfair you cannot come to this final stage and start making basic objections so but why did this happen so i think <clears throat> you see in india fisheries is very insignificant in terms of the gdp of the country and it has received a very step motherly treatment from all uh, uh union governments so i think that this strong and inflexible and actually some somewhat belligerent stand by india is uh, and also stated as though this is in the defense of the poor fisher folk uh, of this country and not allowing the fisheries agreement to pass in its full form that is the three pillars uh and blocking this this final thing on the uh, over capacity in overfishing i i believe this was essentially a public display play leader to the developing countries but once again this was a ploy to bargain for other benefits with other countries and i think i don't know enough about this but i think it is with the us and especially on the agreement on trips related to trade there was some bargain there and this was the way they were able to negotiate that bargain by using again once again fishery subsidies as the 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 kind of shield for that so that's completes my uh, first point it's more about the the overarching framework and the international scenario my second point is about our indian context so the this agreement i feel will create i don't use the word opportunity but i would say that it creates the compelling conditions which will make our government particularly the union government to take seriously both the issue of marine resources and their conservation and the issue of fishing communities so this will be through uh, at least three ways one ensuring better management of the marine resources two by improving the condition of fishing communities and three by enhancing the quality standards of fish trade but you know all this will contribute to sustainable resource use and wholesome human development of the sector but i would add but this requires a lot of collective action from below by fish worker organizations civil society groups to force the government to make the required legislation and policy action that is needed from above if we are to seize so called opportunities in this so let me explain the the wto this agreement which has just passed in its current form that is without the over capacity of overfishing pillar this will be legislation for the management of the whole eez there is no way out of it so i think this is a good aspect the government has been dragging its feet on this and this will now make them enact this legislation which we uh, desperately need the second implication is that it will also have a bearing on the way the regulation and the management of fisheries are currently divided between the maritime states and the union government so i think this will also 
uh, create compelling conditions to foster greater cooperative federalism for fisheries you, uh, and in keeping with our constitutional provisions. So I feel that this is a this is a real opportunity for the for the maritime states. And here is where they should push for this so that it really becomes a collaborative uh, 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 venture. And as I said right at the first point, the nature of fish, because it is moving, you cannot have state specific regulations. You must have cooperation between states and an overarching framework at the federal level. So this is something that uh, this agreement, which was uh, the, 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 the fishery subsidy agreement will force. And finally, this will, <clears throat> the agreement will not stop giving subsidies. There is a, uh, a lot of fear about this. So I, uh, I, I don't think it will stop giving subsidies. I think it, it's creating the context to increase subsidies given to the sector, but the purpose for which the subsidy is given should change. And I think here we have an opportunity to take measures, for example, rebuilding fish stocks, for example, buying back uh, buyback arrangements for reduction of excess capacity, subsidies, that is subsidies that are given for scaling down the capacity, then subsidies which can be given for multiple energy use. You know, every now it's completely dependent on fuel, but the sale can be brought back, multiple energy use. We can use the solar energy for various things on, on the boats. Then, for example, to provide insurance measures as a compensation for what is happening today as a result of climate change, huge amount of weather related unemployment for fishers. And I think this is uh, an area where something like, you know, parametric uh, insurance uh, 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 funds should be created and providing that will be a great boon for, for fishers and all other types of public good investments, which are necessary to facilitate greater safety at sea, which is also very important. And then to finally, to provide social infrastructure uh, uh, investments, which will improve the, you know, the sanitary and phytosanitary measures that will make the uh, export products much more wholesome and safe for international trade. So that's what I have to offer. Uh, as a starting point, just these two major points. And I hope I was able to communicate the seriousness and the urgency of this. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, John, uh, can you take one more minute and explain yes. uh, uh, the public action point which you mentioned? You just mentioned and you wanted to say more about it, but you didn't. Uh, because that is important for our subsequent uh, discussion. <clears throat> public action uh, you, you mean mentioned. You mean the collective action? Uh, yeah, 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 collective action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, uh, you see, the the government will be compelled to make these. Uh, for example, the EZ Management Act. They will be compelled to do it because without that, you know, you you cannot uh, you cannot uh, uh, cater to the requirements of the WTO agreement. So that is important. You have to manage the fishery. So so far, that has been put aside. Now, this is a uh, place where the uh, fisher organizations uh, should take a stand on what, what, they, what they want in this. Now, you see, you take deep sea fishing. From the 1950s, we've been talking about deep sea fishing. Now, see, the reality is that the fish that is available in the real deep sea in, our, uh, in the, uh, the seas around us are not... Uh, economically viable enough to make you know separate investments this is why deep sea fishing uh, has not developed deep sea fishing in the way the government of india has uh, envisaged it that is with big boats and huge uh, you know helicopter on the boat and things like that but look at uh, who is doing deep sea fishing today it is the small fishermen from tutur much, more than 50% of fish which is caught in the so-called deep sea comes from those fishermen. Now, they have very simple uh, equipment. Uh, of course, the, the conditions are very harsh. Now, those are the 
boats which have been listed as IUU fishing by the uh, by the um, uh, tuna uh, body, which Sebastian mentioned. Now, how how fair is that? Now you see, those are the kinds of uh, fishers and equipment which should be provided encouragement. I'm using the word encouragement I, if subsidies is a problem. And this can be in various ways. So this is just one example of this. Uh, so uh, then the need for, you know, the fisher organizations in Kerala, they must collaborate with the fisher organizations in Karnataka and the fisher organizations in Tamil Nadu at least and the fisher organizations in Tamil Nadu should link up with those in Andhra Pradesh because you know if fish is caught in Karnataka it doesn't come to Kerala and a lot of for example a lot of the the uh, uh, you know unsustainable fishing that is happening in Kerala is because of the demand from the fish meal factories which are based in Karnataka. So as long as that kind of investment is there, you will have overfishing in Kerala. And that is what we see today. So there has to be much more of this collaboration by worker organizations and civil society groups. And only then will we be able to push the government to make these legislations and to implement them in a in a way which is beneficial for the real stakeholders in the in the in the sector so this will also you know require things like uh, you know some, a point which i have been harping for the last uh, uh, 30 40 years is this the need for some legislation in the form of aquarian reforms where we we say for example that you know one uh, one boat to one uh, owner. If you have huge fleets and uh, operate them, if you have absentee ownership in the fishing, this will lead to unsustainable fishing. But if you have a, a reform, yeah, you can create a situation where it is beneficial for all. So I'll stop. I'm sure the yeah, others, yeah. especially my friends in the yeah. panel, will have a lot more to say about this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor John, uh, for the comprehensive presentation. Uh, he covered almost all important aspects related to this issue, um, brought in uh, his rich experience in the area of uh, fisheries and uh, uh, GATT and WG negotiations, and uh, mentioned about uh, the, uh, the huge subsidies that the developed countries uh, uh, pay, uh, give to fishers in the uh, in, in the developed nations now that will raise questions certainly how how this agreement will have impact upon the regime of heavy subsidization in developed countries and uh, the level playing field in international trade as far as fisheries uh, is uh, concerned and uh, i'm particularly thankful for mentioning public action uh, collective action importance of collective action and uh, Rest of our speakers, I think, uh, will uh, emphasize this point of uh, collective action because uh, they have been uh, in the in the lead of uh, such efforts in the fishery sector. I'll now call upon Sri Pulluvala Stanley, he is the general secretary of All India Fish and uh, Fisheries Workers Federation, and uh, he was also chairman of Malsifed earlier. And uh, he's a person with rich experience uh, in the in the sector, and uh, has been uh, leading as a fish workers for decades together. Uh, Sri Pulluvala Stanley. Now, now onwards, uh, no. Um, in fact, now when I set out the rules of the game, I forgot to mention this. Uh, question answer presentations can be in Malayalam too. Uh, you can mix Malayalam and English. And uh, if it is required, we can we can translate important uh, points. Sri Pulluvala Stanley. Sir. Are you connected now? Emmanuel. Manuel, can you can you contact Sri Pulluvala Stanley? Sir, I will call him, sir. I will call, sir, now.
maybe we'll um, move on to Sri Charles George. Is uh, is from Ike, um, Kerala, Manasthuvali Ikevedi. He's a very good friend of mine, and uh, like um, Sri St Stanley, he was one of the major, one of the main organizers of uh, fish and fisheries workers uh, uh, in Indian coast. So Charles George, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. They anyhow managed to gain in the last WTO. That is my notion. Uh, we have gained two days more for our discussing our demands and gained two more years for our subsidies. And the section 3.8 and 4.4 is giving us more uh, time to spend more money for this purpose. My version is that we have to discuss about only about the subsidy policy of India. The subsidy policy, uh, the last discussion about the WTO, Dr. Sumaila and the PEW of America vehemently criticized about the agreement. So they are skeptic about the uh, reaching out of this agreement. And my point is that we have to, India government will be uh, uh, re-examine their, uh, their subsidy policy. In India, as per the government, uh, government statistics, there are 3,15,627 coastal boards and canoes operated in India. This is a huge amount, sir. Only 93.25, uh, 93,025,257 uh, boards are needed. That is optimal level. Now we have three times more uh, vessels operating in Indian Ocean. This is the petroleum issue we are facing. So, uh, yeah, how we have to combat this? That is the major issue. And recently, that means one month, week ago, uh, central government, with the aid of, with the help of MBDA, held a meeting in Cochin. And I am also participant of that meeting. At that meeting, they told us that we will allow, uh, as per the Pradhana Mandri Malchitambadra Yojana program, 2,000 rupees to the uh, fish workers forums, that means their cooperative societies, for building up industrial, fishes, industrial fishing. For which purpose they have uh, told us that they will give one uh, new deep sea fishing fleet to upgradation of, of uh, uh, fishing fleets. Three, bio toilet. Three, safety kits. Five, replacement of older boats with new ones. These are their proposals. A new fishing fleet will cost at least 50 to 80 uh, crore rupees. And it will be dispersed to the fishermen cooperatives. None of India's fishermen cooperatives are able to buy these things. So the government told us that they will give 40% subsidies and 60% rupees will be given by us. None of the Indian fishermen is not at all capable of giving these things. Even India itself, in the World Forum, India status is developing country. But my opinion is that we have represented low income fit deficient guru in the fishery sector. So we are not at all capable of displacing this money for these things. And the other aspect is that we have to consider about, as per Josh, John, as already John Korean says about the Tuturu fishermen. They have already have 900 fishing boats for them. All of them come under the purview of FAO, that is all of them come under the purview of just a small scale fishing. These small scale fishers boards are uh, overall length is 20 to 22 uh, meters long. They are using these fishers, uh, uh, these methods, and go up to Oman to the north and up to Seychelles to the south with these uh, their own methods. And what happened recently? Recently uh, in Colombo, they build up a 
port name le Dikotiva. That port was built up by the Chinese. And as a reward for this, they allowed 10 Chinese vessels to operate there. Where these vessels operated? They operated in the Shago selective area. So they will catch all the tunas from this area. That will be a hindrance for us. And as per the note given by uh, Thomas, uh, given by Sebastian Matthew, that thus a flag state member cannot extend subsidies for fish stocks in high seas outside the periphery of purview of RFMO. What about the RFMO of our state? You know, I think IOTC is the foremost thing in this area. And what is what are their actions? There are I have gone through the documents of IOTC. I think IOTC should be democratized. That is our view. Because uh, Xavier Frigo is a boat from Spain. And uh, uh, Colombo Spring from the Netherlands. And Panama, six vessels from Panama are operating in Indian Ocean. EU, Britain, France, Spain are the members of IOTC, Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. So what is the use of this Indian Ocean Tuna Commission? So it should be reconstituted. That is our view. And another issue is that uh, about uh, India government's policy. In 2017, it propagated its national marine fishing policy. And in 2020, early, they propagated about their uh, marine uh, deep uh, about their uh, blue economy policy and 2020 their IMO policy also. In three aspects, in these three papers, they are vehemently, they are continuously propagating about uh, empowering the MNCs of India in Indian Ocean. That is their point. My point is that, as I have already said that, there are 3,15,000 boats operating in India. This itself shows that it is a labor intensive sector. In a labor intensive sector, our motto is to be that, as, as Josh Gurian says, that it should be cooperatized or it should be uh, it should be cooperative or unmodernized. That should be our motto. So uh, these things to be maintained. And uh, uh, about RFMO also, uh, we have to. Uh, uh, what is our relation with our neighboring countries, RFMO? Our neighboring countries, we have an antagonistic position with our neighboring countries. China is not with us. Pakistan is against us. And uh, 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 Sri Lanka is against us. And Bangladesh is against us. And how can we be, it is be possible to form an RFMO? So we should think about to revitalize, to reformalize our political position. Our political position is that we have to join uh, the uh, called uh, political and uh, uh, organizational uh, issue of uh, propagated by America. America never accepted the Indian, Indian Ocean food. They are uh, making so many problems. They are always in the name of TED, TED, Turtle uh, Eradication Devices, in the name of uh, uh, gear and in the name of all other things. They are negating India's export, in, they are in, negating India's import. So India is uh, very much eager to join the Quad. Quad members are America, Japan, and Australia. And what is the problem we are facing in Lakshadweep? It is not with the, that of uh, Kavi Bhigarada. It is not with that of, it is that of, uh, only with that of blue economy. They are facing the issue of blue economy. So we have to reconsider all these things. And about the IMF also, I want to speak about it. Indian marine fishery, even after 75 years of independence, we have not have our own uh, fishing law. Only state law is prevailing now. So we are doing only IUU fishing, sir. Majority of our fishing vessels that is operating uh, more than 12 nautical mile away is operating IUU fishery. So we have to uh, chalk out a program for IMF. And la last year, India government uh, chalked out a, a, a 
program for I am and circulated to us. At that meeting, I raised 16 points. None of them were addressed. The Central government uh, uh, approached us and we raised 16 points about this thing. But none of them were accepted. Without accepting it, it should be presented in the next parliament, I think so. So we have to present it after our discussion. And what is about management plan? That is the major important thing. In Kerala, Kerala government all, always speaking about in their Pragarna Patriga, in their election manifesto that they will adopt, uh, as, uh, as former John, uh, John Kurian says that, we will adopt acquiral reforms. Acquiral reforms means uh, uh, every fleet ownership should be given to pit worker or their fishery cooperative. That is not given, that is not even, even today it is not applied. And Kerala government nowadays is, uh, uh, says that they are approaching, they are uh, decided to have a three-tier management system. A state level management committee is also uh, 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 propagated and adopted. And I am also the member of state level management committee. District level and uh, area level committee should be formed later. And above that, uh, I think as John Kurian says, we have to adopt a zonal level a management committee and national level and effort from that out of form is also to be constituted. That is our method to these things. And uh, anyhow, I think I am raising some of the problems we are facing. And we have to uh, consider the uh, uh, pieces of, of Indian Ocean also. In Indian Ocean, we have 2.3 lakh ton of tuna existed. Only 1.2 lakh is now tapped. And uh, 6.3 lakh ton of victor feeds are, are purple back the squid disease exist. And 10 lakh ton of victor feeds are there. We never uh, accepted, we never tapped this thing. In the ABNJ, that means over our exclusive economic zone, there are 200 uh, uh, miles of ABNJ, area beyond our national jurisdiction. In that area, we are committed with these 900 small boats are committed with that of Chinese vessels and Hong Kong vessels. So we have to adopt a policy how to tap this species specific, that means 6.3 lakh purple back risked, 10 lakh micro feet, 2.3 lakh ton of shonas and one lakh ton of tuna-like fishes, that means marlin, seal fish, seal fish, and other things. So we have to make a program for this. Otherwise, uh, in the last week, the central, central government conducted a meeting. That means they are propagating that we will, they will give industrial fishing fleets to cooperatives. At that meeting, a man from Goa attends the meeting. He told that he has uh, 100 Works with him. He told that he will cooperate with this idea and he will have a boat, industrial fishing boat. That boat will compete with us. So we will never allow, allow these things. We are defeated the uh, industrial fishing policy of 1991 India government and Minagumar report of 19, 2004 14. So we are in the position to have uh, a cooperative and to or oh, more than Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Charles George, for uh, bringing in many points uh, which were left out uh, in earlier uh, discussions. Uh, it's very important that uh, missed out points are uh, specifically mentioned in this uh, discussion. Uh, now, uh, let me call upon uh, Sridhar Radhakrishnan to make his uh, representation. Sridhar. Yeah, one second, one second. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, one of the things that I want to say as a, I mean, as an, as a, uh, obviously it's always a pleasure to listen to uh, Vishwajit Ji because uh, I've been listening to him in various meetings that we kept attending on some of these 
WTOs and free trade agreements and the and, and global trade regimes and uh, India's responses and is always in that sense given a lot of clarity as to uh, where this has to be positioned, uh, both in terms of regulatory and I mean government uh, you know, you know pr pressures or whether it be based on the communities and uh, public perceptions. So it's always been a pleasure to listen to Dr. Da. Uh, and uh, between them and Sebastian Mathieu and then uh, John uh, Kurian, there has been such a lot of clarity that has been built on this. For me, as a sort of continuing to be a layman in this process of understanding trade, and Dr. Harlal has always helped us in doing that, I want to you know I have, I and, and moreover, not coming from the fishing sector. I mean, obviously, I've not been following the fishing sector as I was probably following the agricultural sector or uh, the, the trips and uh, the seeds and other kinds of sectors of that nature. Uh, I want to raise certain concerns in basically a, a, a not in any organized form because I, it's it's a it's a whole series of things that I jotted down and I thought putting it across would mean something, especially after listening to uh, John Korean, Dr. John Korean and uh, Charles uh, in terms of the kind of uh, questions that we need to ask ourselves and the responses that also that we probably have to ourselves, you know, uh, create uh, to 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 uh, to uh, respond to this current you know situation of of uh, the agreement already in place kind of. Uh, so I will I will surely not have an order around it. I'll just you know put this up as it comes. Uh, first of all, I felt that uh, that. There is a whole set of regulatory things that are coming up. I mean, this has been this we have been facing in the agriculture sector also, um, where more and more regulatory regimes, more and more monitoring, more and more uh, compliance mechanisms are unfortunately and unnecessarily thrust on people. Now, while it's agreeable that governments will have to do this, even if you're talking about conservation or where we are talking about you know stocks and how to how to stop depletion of it or how to replenish it or whether we are talking about illegal operations in the seas. Uh, unfortunately, it is going to trickle down to and, and, and Dr. As Harilal, Dr. Harilal pointed out, it's going to trickle down to people, which means the community itself and the players in the uh, in, in, in the industry as well. So how is that going to be buffered by the state or the center? would be a matter that I think we should flag off uh, initially itself because that will immediately impact not just the livelihoods, lives and incomes of this of fisher folk or the industry or the workers in the industry, but it will also impact uh, shift from more and more shift from uh, shift in the sense, you know, in terms of food uh, into aquaculture and also uh, impacting food security in some sense. So I think that, that that is one thing that I want to flag off here. Uh, the second thing is obviously the whole trick around subsidies. Now here I have a problem because even in the agriculture we are seeing this. At the end of the day, even today, there is no level playing field. The subsidy regimes in the developed countries continue unabated in some sense. They have been able to do the shifting into the green and blue box is very effectively in some sense. And we are not able to do it. And in fact, we are being forced to even take off some of the support systems that we have had, for example, in the farming sector, where there was this whole big issue on uh, support prices. And it's still there. The WTO is probably going to again come back and discuss on the on, on, on the subsidy, on, on the support systems, on, uh, on which will impact our minimum support price regime. One of the reasons why when the farmer's law came up the three you know draconian or, or or sort of badly designed laws came up uh, we purposefully and sort of effectively put the minimum support price agenda into that discussion and uh, and, and literally caught the government in the wrong foot uh, so that they were sort of trapped between you know pushing the law and talking about minimum support price and at the end of the day after such a long struggle they had to drop all of it and keep it in abeyance 
and not necessarily talk about MSP, but the MSP is there for us to discuss as a, as a national issue. And hence, when you are going to the WTO to discuss MSP, India will have to respond to it in, uh, on, on, account, on account of its farmers. Now, in the fishery sector, do we have such a process happening, uh, especially in the subsidy regime? Do we have a list of all these kind of subsidies that uh, other governments are, you know, putting in, for instance, the, the fuel subsidies in America, which is probably the largest subsidies that they have uh, of all the, uh, you know, total fish, sub fish, sub fish, fish uh, sector subsidies. Uh, does, does it compare in any sense with what India is providing to its farmer? I mean, it's fisher food, as Charles was putting up. So this whole trick around subsidies, I think we need a better understanding on it and a grip on it and be able to, you know, address it in some sense. Uh, I will I will obviously be coming back to some of these concerns later in what I'm trying to say. Uh, I had a feeling that on the other sense, and, and this is something that I agree with, John, uh, uh, the fact that this probably is a wonderful opportunity for taking conservation efforts forward. Uh, and also, in some sense, the WTO has, uh, has uh, you know, it was a losing ground. WTO's, WTO was basically a losing ground in comparison with uh, free trade agreements and bilateral and regional agreements. And where all these agreements were taking an upper hand over uh, nations' need to come together on one trade platform. They were talking about bilateral platforms and regional platforms, and the WTO was going down the drain in some sense. This is probably putting it back into the pedestal itself. So we obviously cannot throw this out in some in any any form or 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 basically say that no, this is not agreeable and that India is going to have a problem. Or I mean, while the pressure from the globe is also there, India also probably has the obligation to keep this going. So that is a, a point that I felt needs to be you know put up with. Uh, the other thing that I am I'm sort of worried about is this whole, I mean, I'm coming back to this, you know, the subsidy question. See, off late, I'm seeing that nations all over the world or in India or let's say in, even in Kerala, we're all talking about the ease of business and, and not exactly the subsidy regimes. And these are two different things in my perception. And I mean, I could be wrong. I want, you know, more, uh, you know, enlightened people to, to probably tell us this. But is there... I mean, does this whole subsidy thing eventually come down to policy level, you know, interventions which affect large number of players or, and just at that level, or does it actually come down to individual levels? This is a question I also want to put to uh, some of the speakers and whoever wants to can help us understand this. Does it exactly mean that, okay, there are 10 trawling, uh, you know, people uh, operating, three of them could be actually not registered, illegal, etc. And seven of them are legal, registered, etc. So the seven of them will go into all the compliance measures that uh, are set up by the system so that they get the subsidies. The three illegals don't even need subsidies. They'll continue to do illegal operations. And this regime is not going to stop it because it is all subsidy based. And it's all at some point, it's going to be individual based. So do we actually have a scenario where illegal operations uh, and, and how does India, how is India going to tackle that? Because as building the whole process into a subsidy regime literally could also mean that we are going to, I mean, there is a threat. I do not know whether it's right. Others should probably help me do that, understand that. But are we trying to, would there be a, m more of people wanting to opt to illegal operations, unregulated operations and, um, and, 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 uh, and, and, uh, not get into the radar at all uh, because they probably are not working on the subsidy element but on the more commercial element and are probably looking at an ease of business operation rather than uh, being regular uh, regulated in some sense so this is a concern that i have a feeling which basically means that that kind of commercial which is what we sometimes call the mafia or the underhand deals or or the illegals uh, would have a better hand at a better space than the two set of people, one the legalized ones and two the uh, the, the livelihood based fisher sector, the, the ones uh, who are on the coast and are living off the sea. So uh, I'm just raising that concern. Um, obviously, this is probably going to increase the cost of fish and uh, going to hit on the staple. Uh, 
which is right now you know cheap and available to a large number of indians as a staple food uh, this is probably going to hit on the cost and this is in that sense probably going to hit on uh, food security this is something which is very very worrying as far as i'm concerned i would want people to you know uh, the, the the more enlightened to uh, sort of um, help us understand that uh, i also have a feeling that the subsidy centric thing approach largely it's a subsidy based on subsidies is exactly not going to help conservation in the way we think would help conservation it's a hunch i'm not professing anything but it's a hunch and i and and it's 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 some sense, in some sense a hypothesis i would like people to help us understand that uh just a couple of more points mm, i had a feeling that uh in this particular you know agreement debates and discussions that happened in the country uh there wasn't enough civil society and stakeholder engagements of any major form uh, maybe i was i am ignorant of it because i work on the agriculture sector so if we follow that but probably we not looked at the fishing sector but i do not know whether the fishing sector population was actually involved in a, in a, in a serious engagement in a sense that they are building the pressure on the central government on the negotiating teams because i remember in all these free trade agreements rcep's ftas indo asean where we lost out and and the wto's there was this element of very very strong public responses i myself was involved in some of the responses in trying to collate public debates and, uh, and 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 put signatory responses not at just the central level but even at the wto level uh, you know to put pressure on other nations not to uh, you know um, uh, not to drive their point uh, uh, which are harmful for uh, the india's you know indian indian um, agriculture or, or farming or fisher community so the farming sector we used to have that kind of engagements and And, and and strong responses i'm not very sure whether we really had that in this except for some of the you know the experts like uh, those who have come and spoken here have did we actually have community uh, standing up and responding on this is something that i really don't know at the end of the day the onus is right now on the fisher organizations as john pirian also tried to point out it is squarely on the fisher organizations fisher folk organizations and unfortunately so or for, or, or at, in some sense is an opportunity as well this is going ahead and i don't think we have a, a mechanism of walking out of it or moving out of it so this is going ahead now in that sense i am reminded of some of the things that happened in in, in kerala for instance uh, you know when uh, the when i mean the other the other set of people who are right now or or i'm mean, i'm drawing a parallel okay i'm just drawing a parallel now see when the forest and you know fringe forest area people and the and the ones in the forest the the, the farmers and uh, tribes living in, near the forest they are uh, they all stood up in arms along with the uh, church and along with the parties both all the parties uh, against let's say something like the western ghats ecology expert panel report uh, this is something this is a double edged you know process on one side you obviously have regulations and uh, coming in you have to have landscape regulations but on the other end there was an opportunity the landscape regulations were actually very hard on people probably and and the fish and and much of the farmer population were probably right in saying that we cannot be regulated like this but then there was also an opportunity on the other side now what has happened is if you look at the recent supreme court order of 1 km buffer zone and the state is now you know going up and down trying to see how to resolve that the concern the resolution was already there in the wgeep the resolution was simple it was for the panchayat there was broad guidelines it was for the panchayats to actually decide how you are going to do the regulations in their panchayats instead of looking at it seriously they threw the whole report out the assembly stood together and threw the whole report report out ex- except for uh, the the late you know visionary pt thomas the rest of them threw it out what happened at the end of the day it's come back and bitten us so the point is right now you have an opportunity to work on a conservation uh, process build on livelihoods and supports and subsidies that we can probably use for uh, you know building our uh, not just livelihoods but also our incomes and, uh, and 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 welfare schemes at the same time do we 
are we prepared to do that and how well are we going to both academically and politically academically politically and you know socially uh, prepare for it or get the community to prepare for it is the organizations ready for it is the organizations going to discuss this beyond all the other kinds of discussions that they are doing are we ready for that so that is where the challenge right now lies if we can turn this into an opportunity i am not very sure how well we can do it and i will conclude by you know because right now we are all looking at the approach paper of the 14th five year plan of kerala and because this is also a kerala centric meeting and we are looking at the fishery sector the whole focus of the fishery sector almost 70 80% of the fishery sector focuses on aquaculture and not on marine fishes fishing it reads as if the marine fishing sector is going to be dumped and you know completely ignored in the future if this approach paper is a very clear indicator of it there are only two things that are talking that we talk about in the uh, in the marine fishing uh, sector is one is how do we keep them going you know economically supporting them bringing their you know those kind of things and secondly how do you build cooperatives and collectives to do deep sea fishing as if that is the only way we can now go ahead so and 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 then the current you know the wto subsidies regime that now that is that we have gone and signed is going to make it very difficult for our cooperatives and collectives to run uh such um, deep sea fishing uh, in competition with other uh, sectors we wouldn't be able to really do it at the cost that is probably going to come up on this compliance mechanisms so this is largely what uh, i thought uh, we should i mean i should comment on uh, at the end of the day i will conclude by saying that it is the fisher folk communities and the collectives and the organizations uh, the charles the peter is no more but the the uh, multicultural federations and other fisher uh, you know people working in the fisher community who are many of them are here uh, along with the fisher community uh, have to take this up seriously and see how we can be a pressure group to make the central government work up policies that will keep us going and 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 use this as an and, and build an opportunity around this whole uh, regime that has come up so that's what i thought i'll Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Sridhar, for uh, raising many, many interesting questions. Uh, I would like to highlight one, uh, two questions which particularly impressed me. Uh, one is uh, the subsidy-specific nature of this agreement. Of, co of course, this is an agreement on uh, subsidies. It will have to focus on subsidies. But uh, how realistic? are the expectations regarding its impact on conservation of this fish resources can a subsidy centric approach address this problem at all because uh, large operators as rida was mentioning large operators uh, need not probably require subsidies now, even without subsidies they can operate and uh, they can register they will be uh, legal but uh, uh, without subsidies they will operate and uh, denying subsidies uh, alone will not certainly uh, solve the problem of uh, conservation of course he was also mentioning about uh, uh, the the green box uh, route of uh, camouflaging subsidies in agriculture and he was raising concerns regarding a kind of repeat in the area of fisheries also and uh, then uh, there was another question which he raised i think uh, bishil uh, can respond to that uh, uh, probably sebastian also uh, you know if somebody uh, is uh, doing illegal fishing and uh, how the subsidy will be cut and who will be suffering from that in request um basilla uh, the kerala mansitorali federation the secretary ana ബസിൽ ബസിലിന് മലയാളത്തിൽ സംസാരിക്കാം ഇംഗ്ലീഷിലും മിക്സ് ചെയ്ത് സംസാരിക്കാം എങ്ങനെയാന്ന് വെച്ച് കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ ഇറ്റ്സ് യുവർ ചോയ്സ് ബസിൽ ആർ യു ഹിയർ
Okay. And let me now uh, invite uh, our uh, paper presenters <clears throat> to respond to the discussion. Uh, Bishuddh, uh, you, ca you can start. Professor Bishuddh, if you are. Hello. Hello. I didn't complete. Sorry. I didn't complete myself. I am Basil. Ah, yeah, come on, come on. You you um, you speak. And yeah. you can speak. Yeah. Okay. Please. Can you hear me right now? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, I can I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Please carry on. I, I, I take this opportunity to thank CDS for convening this very important meeting. I represent the Kerala Fishermen Union CITU, as rightly pointed out by Dr. John Kurian. We have a lot of uh, concerns, apprehensions about the proposed document. But one thing, let me make it very clear. Hello. Yes. yes. Uh, last February. Is no problem. We can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, last February. 17, I mean 2021. Once the president of India signed the ordinance related to blue economies, the Indian fishermen, they are very much worried. They are very much concerned about their future. And now the new proposals has been come as part of this uh, subsidies. But after all, what is the subsidy being granted to the fishermen right now? The only subsidy which is being granted is related to kerosene. In the fishing sector, the transformation took place uh, during early 80s, 82, 83. That is the motorization. Hello, the transformation yes. from the traditional way, it has got shifted to motorization. Then the fishermen used to get a subsidy, subsidized kerosene uh, per month, almost 350 liters. But now what is the situation? It is less than 100 liters per month. Per month. That too, they have to buy a huge price. The recent newspaper you must have read is almost 142 rupees. So, what other subsidy is being given right now? Nothing. Even for the boats, they are using diesel. Diesel, uh, it is very ridiculous to note that they have to pay road tax. Of the various components for fixing the price of diesel, one component is the road tax. Which boat is using roads? They're going to the sea. 18% is being taken from them. So, see how the fisherman is being looted. So, as rightly pointed out by Dr. John Kurian, we, are, we have some concerns. Of course, act uh, rules related to overfishing unscientific fishing, it would be welcomed. It is a matter of great concern, overfishing and uh, unscientific methods of fishing. Any law related to that is there. Other concerns about the traditional fishermen, it will be collectively opposed. As you all have witnessed when the Dr. Meena Kumari Commission report proposed a lot of things, it was opposed collectively, especially in the state of Kerala. Those things will be completely clear in the future also, definitely in we will have a combined collective initiative to oppose all concerns, anything which is against the vision. That's all. We, we can't hear you yes, now. Yes. Maybe it got muted. Uh, yeah, come on, you can speak now. You are, you are muted. Hello, it's finished the sir. Hello, hello. Can you hear? Yeah, yeah, please, please. 
any proposals or decisions as part of this agreement if it is against us it will be opposed collectively okay 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 your presentation is over so yes, thank you over, over. yeah thank you for highlighting the question of uh, the real uh, subsidies that is really flowing to the fishery yeah. sector now uh, if you if you if uh, the subsidies are confined mainly to fuel and uh, if you compare indian fuel prices with international prices uh, then probably we will have to speak or think in terms of negative subsidies which exist in the sector because it's a highly fuel intensive operation so uh, negative subsidy in the area of fuel can be right. can be quite quite disturbing now um, let me uh, get uh, professor bishil dar to respond to the discussion Hello. Yes. Others like Tipto and AJ Vijayan are present here. They are present in the sector yeah, also. Ah, uh, AJ Vijayan sir, I am particularly invited. Anna, please, can you can you unmute and speak? Ah, <coughs> uh, sorry, I am for some sorry. You know, today is like a calm one. Anna, in general. ഇന്ത്യയിലെ സബ്സിഡിയെ കുറിച്ച് നമുക്ക് വ്യക്തമായ ധാരണ ഫിഷറി സെക്ടറിൽ ഇപ്പൊ നൽകി വരുന്ന സബ്സിഡിയെ കുറിച്ച് വ്യക്തമായ ധാരണ ഇല്ലെന്നാണ് എനിക്ക് ഇപ്പൊ ഈ പ്രസന്റേഷൻസിൽ നിന്നും പോലും എനിക്ക് അധികം മനസ്സിലാക്കാൻ കഴിഞ്ഞില്ല ഇപ്പൊ നമ്മളെ ഒരുപക്ഷെ മലയാളികളായ നമ്മൾ ഞാൻ മലയാളത്തിലാ സംസാരിക്കുന്നത് കുഴപ്പമില്ലല്ലോ ഇല്ല ഓക്കെ ഞാന് നമ്മളെ ഇപ്പൊ കൂടുതൽ സ്വാധീനിച്ചിരിക്കുന്നത് ഈ കഴിഞ്ഞ കുറെ കഴിഞ്ഞ ആഴ്ചകളില് മലയാള മനോരമയിലും മാതൃഭൂമിയിലും എഡിറ്റോറിയലായിട്ട് രണ്ട് കാര്യങ്ങൾ ഈ സബ്സിഡിയുമായിട്ട് ബന്ധപ്പെട്ട് വരികയുണ്ടായി അപ്പൊ അതിനകത്ത് തന്നെ ഈ പാവപ്പെട്ട ചെറുകിട മത്സ്യത്തൊഴിലാളികളെ ഇത് വളരെ വലുത് ഗുരുതരമായി ബാധിക്കും എന്നുള്ള രീതിയിലൊക്കെയാണ് ഈ രണ്ട് കൂട്ടരും എഴുതി കണ്ടത് പക്ഷെ എന്റെ അറിവില് ഇന്ത്യയില് ഈ സബ്സിഡി ഇപ്പോ നൽകി വരുന്നത് യഥാർത്ഥത്തിൽ ഇന്ത്യയിലെ ചെറുകിടക്കാർക്കല്ല നേരത്തെ ബേസില്ലാല് സൂചിപ്പിച്ച ആ മണ്ണെണ്ണ സബ്സിഡി എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് ശരിക്കും സബ്സിഡി അല്ല അത് ഇവിടെ പി ഡി എസില് വിതരണം ചെയ്യുന്ന പബ്ലിക് ഡിസ്ട്രിബ്യൂഷൻ സിസ്റ്റത്തിൽ ഇവിടെ കേന്ദ്ര ഗവൺമെന്റ് എല്ലാ സംസ്ഥാനങ്ങൾക്കും അനുവദിക്കുന്ന മണ്ണെണ്ണ കുറച്ചെടുത്ത് കേരളം പിന്നെ ഈ ഫിഷറി സെക്ടറിൽ ഒരു റേഷൻ സിസ്റ്റം പോലെ ഉണ്ടാക്കി കൊടുത്തുകൊണ്ടിരിക്കുകയാണ് ഇതാണ് നടന്നുകൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്നത് അതിൻ്റെയാണ് അളവ് പലപ്പോഴും കുറയ്ക്കുകയൊക്കെ ചെയ്യുന്നത് അതൊരു സബ്സിഡി എന്ന് പറയുന്ന ഗണത്തിൽ വരില്ല എന്നാണ് ഞാൻ മനസ്സിലാക്കുന്നത് കാരണം അത് പൊതുവായ പിന്നെ വിളക്ക് കത്തിക്കാൻ വേണ്ടിയിട്ട് കേന്ദ്രം കൊടുക്കുന്ന മണ്ണെണ്ണ എടുത്തിട്ടാണ് മത്സ്യബന്ധന മേഖലയ്ക്ക് കൊടുക്കുന്നത് പക്ഷെ എൻ്റെ അറിവിൽ ഇന്ത്യൻ ഫിഷറീസില് കേരളത്തിലില്ല പക്ഷെ വലിയ ചില മത്സ്യബന്ധന സംസ്ഥാനങ്ങളിൽ ഇപ്പോൾ ഗുജറാത്ത് മഹാരാഷ്ട്ര തമിഴ്നാട് ആന്ധ്ര തുടങ്ങിയ സംസ്ഥാനങ്ങളിൽ യന്ത്രവൽകൃത ബോട്ടുകൾക്ക് ഡീസൽ സബ്സിഡി ഉണ്ട് അവർ സ്റ്റേറ്റിൽ നിന്ന് കൊടുക്കുന്ന ആ സ്റ്റേറ്റ് ക
ഒരു പക്ഷേ കേന്ദ്രത്തിന്റെയും അതിനുവേണ്ടി എന്തെങ്കിലും സഹായം ചെയ്യുന്നുണ്ടോ എന്ന് എനിക്ക് വ്യക്തമായിട്ട് അറിയില്ല സബ്സിഡി എന്നുള്ള നിലയിലാണ് അത് കൊടുത്തത് അതൊരു ടാക്സ് പിന്നെ ഒഴിവാക്കി സബ്സിഡി പോലെയാണ് അത് വരുന്നത് പലത്തിൽ കേരളത്തിലെ യന്ത്രവൽക്കൃത ബോട്ടുടമകൾക്ക് അങ്ങനെ കൊടുക്കുന്നില്ല അങ്ങനെ കൊടുക്കാൻ കൊടുത്താൽ അത് പ്രശ്നമാകുമെന്ന് കേരളത്തിൽ ഭരിക്കുന്നവർക്ക് അറിയാം അത് ചെയ്യാൻ കഴിയില്ല എന്നുള്ളതാണ് അപ്പൊ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ചെറുകിടക്കാർക്ക് അതുപോലുള്ള സബ്സിഡി കൊടുക്കേണ്ടി വരുമെന്ന് അപ്പൊ ഈ സബ്സിഡി നമ്മളിപ്പോ നിലവിലിരിക്കുന്ന സബ്സിഡി കുറിച്ച് നമുക്ക് വ്യക്തമായ ഒരു ധാരണ ആദ്യം ഒരു വിശകലനം ആവശ്യമാണ് ഇന്ത്യയിലെ ഈ മേഖലയിലെ ഇങ്ങനെയൊരു തീരുമാനം എങ്ങനെ ബാധിക്കും എന്നുള്ളത് അതേസമയം പിന്നെ ഇന്ത്യ ഗവൺമെന്റിന് വേറെ പല സബ്സിഡൈസ് ചെയ്ത് ഈ ഫിഷറീസ് മേഖലയില് പിന്നെ കൊടുക്കാനുള്ള ചില സ്കീമുകളുണ്ട് ഇപ്പൊ ഇത് ഞാൻ ഈ പറയുന്നത് മറൈൻ ക്യാപ്ചർ ഫിഷറിയുടെ കാര്യത്തിൽ മാത്രമാണ് കാരണം അതിന്റെ കാര്യം മാത്രമാണല്ലോ ഈ ഈ ഡബ്ല്യു ടി ഒ റൗണ്ടിൽ ചർച്ച ചെയ്ത് സബ്സിഡിയുടെ കാര്യത്തിൽ വരുന്നത് അത് മാത്രമാണ് ഇന്ത്യയെ സംബന്ധിച്ച് ഈ മറൈൻ ക്യാപ്ചർ മേഖല എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് ഇന്ന് വളരെ ഏറ്റവും മത്സ്യമേഖലയ്ക്കകത്ത് തന്നെ തികച്ചും പിന്നെ മൊത്തത്തിൽ ഇന്ത്യ നോക്കുമ്പോഴത്തേക്കും വളരെ കുറവാണ് അപ്പൊ ആകെ എന്റെ അറിവില് ഒരു പന്ത്രണ്ടര മില്യൺ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ നൂറ്റി ഇരുപത്തിയാറ് ലക്ഷം മത്സ്യം ഇന്ത്യയിൽ ഉൽപ്പാദിപ്പിച്ചതിൽ തൊണ്ണൂറ് ലക്ഷവും ഉൾനാടൻ മേഖലയിൽ നിന്നാണ് വെറും മുപ്പത്തിയേഴ് ലക്ഷം മാത്രമേ മുപ്പത്തഞ്ച് ലക്ഷവും മാത്രമേ കടൽ മേഖലയിൽ നിന്നുള്ളൂ അതാണെങ്കിൽ കുറഞ്ഞു കുറഞ്ഞു വരികയുമാണ് അപ്പൊ ഈ ഈ പിന്നെ ഈ മേഖല ഈ ക്യാപ്ചർ ഫിഷറിയിലെ ഇന്ന് നേരിടുന്ന വളരെ ഗുരുതരമായിട്ടുള്ള വലിയ പ്രതിസന്ധിയിലൂടെയാണ് കടന്നു പോകുന്നത് എന്ന് കൂടി നമ്മൾ എല്ലാവരും ഓർക്കേണ്ടതുണ്ട് ഇപ്പൊ കേരളത്തിൽ തന്നെ ഇപ്പൊ വളരെ വലിയ ഗുരുതരമായ പ്രതിസന്ധിയിലാണ് കടന്നു പോകുന്നത് അപ്പൊ ഈ സാ ഈ ഒരു കോണ്ടക്സ്റ്റിൽ വേണം നമ്മൾ ഈ സബ്സിഡിയെയും അതിന്റെ കാര്യങ്ങളെയും നോക്കിക്കാണേണ്ടത് അപ്പൊ യഥാർത്ഥത്തില് ഈ മനോരമയും മാതൃഭൂമിയും പറയുന്നത് പോലെ ഈ ഇത് നമ്മളെ ഈ സബ്സിഡിയുടെ രൂപത്തിലല്ല ബാധിക്കാൻ പോകുന്നത് മറിച്ച് ട്രേഡിന്റെ പ്രശ്നം വരുമ്പോഴാണ് നേരത്തെ പലരും ചൂണ്ടിക്കാണിച്ചതുപോലെ റെസ്ട്രിക്ഷൻസ് വന്നു കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ അത് എല്ലാവരെയും ബാധിക്കും ഇന്ത്യയെ ബാധിക്കും എന്നുള്ളത് അപ്പൊ ആ നിലയ്ക്ക് വേണം നമ്മൾ ഇതിനെ നോക്കി കാണേണ്ടത് എന്നെനിക്കൊരു അപേക്ഷയുണ്ട് അപ്പൊ ആ അർത്ഥത്തില് നമ്മൾ ഈ പ്രശ്നത്തെ കാണുമ്പോ ഇന്ത്യയിലെ ക്യാപ്ചർ ഫിഷറിയെ ഫലപ്രദമായി സ്ഥായിയായ രീതിയിൽ മാനേജ് ചെയ്യാനുള്ള ചെറുകിട മത്സ്യബന്ധന മേഖലയുടെ നിലനിൽപ്പിന് ഊന്നൽ നൽകിക്കൊണ്ടുള്ള ഈ ചെറുകിടയും ഇന്ത്യയിൽ വൻകിടയും ചെറുകിടയും ഉണ്ടെന്നുള്ള യാഥാർത്ഥ്യം കൂടി നമ്മൾ അംഗീകരിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് വേണം ഇത് പറയാൻ അങ്ങനെയുള്ള ഒരു സമീപനം ഏർ വളരെ അത്യന്താപേക്ഷിതമാണ് അങ്ങനെ ഒരു സമീപനത്തിന് ഈ ഈ ഇപ്പൊ വന്നിരിക്കുന്ന ഈ ഡബ്ല്യു ടി ഒയുടെ തീരുമാനങ്ങള് ഉപയോഗപ്പെടുത്താൻ ഫലപ്രദമായി ഉപയോഗപ്പെടുത്താൻ കഴിയുമെങ്കിൽ അതിന് ഉപയോഗപ്പെടുത്തണം അതേസമയം അതിന് ബാധിക്കുന്ന രീതിയിലുള്ള പ്രശ്നങ്ങൾ ഉണ്ടെങ്കിൽ അതിന് നേരിടുകയും വേണം ഇങ്ങനെ ഒരു ഒരു പൊതുവായ നിലപാട് എടുത്തുകൊണ്ട് വേണം നമ്മൾ ഈ പ്രശ്നത്തെ സമീപിക്കേണ്ടതെന്നാണ് എന്റെ അഭിപ്രായം ഇത്രയും മാത്രമേ ഞാൻ പറയുന്നുള്ളൂ താങ്ക് യു എനിക്ക് ഒന്ന് രണ്ടെണ്ണം ആഡ് ചെയ്യാനുള്ളത് ഞാൻ ശ്രീ എ ജെ വിജയൻ പറഞ്ഞതിനോട് ചേർത്താണ് പറയാനുള്ളത് നമ്മൾ ഈ ഈ പറഞ്ഞ സബ്സിഡി റഷ്യവും എന്നോട് നമ്മുടെ മത്സ്യത്തൊഴിലാളികളുമായിട്ട് പരിശോധിക്കുകയാണെന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ ഈ പത്രങ്ങൾ തന്നെ പറയുന്നതും നമുക്ക് ലഭ്യമായ വിവരങ്ങളും വെച്ച് നോക്കണേ വളരെ നെഗ്ലിജിബിൾ ആയിട്ടുള്ള ഒരു സബ്സിഡി റഷ്യമാണ് ഫിഷറി സെക്ടറിൽ നമ്മുടെ രാജ്യത്ത് ഉള്ളത് അപ്പൊ അത് അത് തന്നെ ഹൈലൈറ്റ് ചെയ്യപ്പെടേണ്ട ഒരു ഘടകമാണ് ഈ ചർച്ച വരുമ്പോൾ നേരത്തെ കറക്റ്റായിട്ട് ജോൺ കുര്യൻ സാർ ചൂണ്ടിക്കാണിച്ചതുപോലെ ഇതിനെ ഒരു ട്രേഡ് ഓഫിന് വേണ്ടിയിട്ടാണ് ഇന്ത്യൻ ഗവൺമെന്റ് പലപ്പോഴും പ്രയോജനപ്പെടുത്തുന്നത് ട്രിപ്സുമായിട്ടൊക്കെ ഉള്ള ട്രേഡ് ഓഫിന് ഈ കാര്യത്തിൽ വഴങ്ങുക മറ്റു പല കാര്യങ്ങളിൽ ആനുകൂല്യം നേടിയെടുക്കുക അങ്ങനെ പോകാതിരിക്കണമെന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ ഇതിനെ സംബന്ധിച്ച ഒരു കൃത്യമായ ധാരണ പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ഈ മത്സ്യത്തിൻ്റെ പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ഈ മറൈൻ റിസോഴ്സസിനെ നമുക്ക് എങ്ങനെ ടാപ്പ് ചെയ്യാമെന്നും എങ്ങനെ കൺസർവ് ചെയ്യാമെന്നുള്ള എൻ്റെ ഒരു വ്യക്തമായ ധാരണയോടു കൂടി തന്നെ പോകേണ്ടതുണ്ട്
ധാരാളം മെക്സിക്കൻ ട്രോളേഴ്സ് ഈസ്റ്റ് കോസ്റ്റിൽ ഓപ്പറേറ്റ് ചെയ്തിരുന്നു ആ മെക്സിക്കൻ ട്രോളേഴ്സ് എല്ലാം സബ്സിഡൈസ്ഡ് ആയിരുന്നു അപ്പൊ ഈ വൻകിട മുതലാളിമാർ ഓപ്പറേഷൻസിൽ വരികയാണെങ്കിൽ ഗവൺമെന്റ് ഓഫ് ഇന്ത്യ സബ്സിഡി കൊടുക്കും എന്നുള്ള കാര്യത്തിൽ ഒരു തർക്കവുമില്ല ആ മെക്സിക്കൻ ട്രോളേഴ്സ് എല്ലാം നമ്മുടെ ബാങ്കുകളിൽ നിന്ന് വലിയ തോതിൽ പണം ഈടാക്കിയ പഞ്ചാബിലെയും മറ്റു ഒക്കെ വൻകിട മുതലാളിമാരായിരുന്നു ആ മെക്സിക്കൻ ട്രോളേഴ്സ് എല്ലാം ഇവിടെ ഓപ്പറേറ്റ് ചെയ്തത് ആ കൂട്ടത്തിൽ കേരള ഫിഷറീസ് കോർപ്പറേഷനും മൂന്നോ നാലോ ട്രോളേഴ്സ് എടുത്തിരുന്നു അതെല്ലാം തകർന്ന് തരിപ്പണമായി ആ ആ ഏരിയ ഒന്നും സസ്റ്റെയിൻ ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റിയില്ല എന്നുള്ള നമ്മുടെ ഒരു അനുഭവമാണ് അപ്പൊ നമ്മൾ ഇവിടെ സൂചിപ്പിക്കപ്പെട്ടതുപോലെ നമ്മുടെ വലിയ ഇൻവെസ്റ്റ്മെന്റോട് കൂടിയുള്ള ഡീപ് സി ഫിഷിംഗ് ആക്ടിവിറ്റീസ് സസ്റ്റെയിൻ ചെയ്യുന്നില്ല എന്നുള്ളത് കണ്ടുകൊണ്ട് തന്നെ നമ്മുടെ ലഭ്യമായിട്ടുള്ള മത്സ്യ തൊഴിലാളികളുടെ ശേഷിയും അതിനെ അപ്ഗ്രേഡ് ചെയ്യാൻ കഴിയുന്ന രൂപത്തിലുള്ള ഓറിയന്റേഷനും പരിശീലനവും കൊടുത്തുകൊണ്ട് ഡീപ് സി എക്സ്പ്ലോയിറ്റ് ചെയ്യാൻ കഴിയുന്ന നിലയിലേക്കുള്ള ഒരു എക്കോ സിസ്റ്റം ഇതിൻ്റെ സാധ്യത പ്രയോജനപ്പെടുത്തിക്കൊണ്ട് നമുക്ക് ചെയ്യാൻ കഴിയും എന്നുള്ളത് പരിശോധിക്കണം എന്നുള്ളതാണ് എൻ്റെ ഒരു നിർദ്ദേശം അത് സ്വാഭാവികമായി സാധ്യമാണ് നേരത്തെ പറഞ്ഞതുപോലെ ഒരു അൺറെഗുലേറ്റഡ് ആയിട്ടോ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഇല്ലീഗൽ ആയിട്ടോ പോകാനല്ല ലീഗലായി നമ്മുടെ മത്സ്യത്തൊഴിലാളികളെ തന്നെ ഡീപ് സി എക്സ്പ്ലോയിറ്റ് ചെയ്യാൻ കഴിയുന്ന നിലയിലേക്ക് എക്യൂപ്പ് ചെയ്യണം ആ എക്യൂപ്പ് ചെയ്യുന്നതിന് ഈ ചർച്ചകളെ സാധ്യതയെ പ്രയോജനപ്പെടുത്താൻ കഴിയുമോ എന്നുള്ളത് പരിശോധിക്കണം എന്നുള്ളതാണ് ഒരു നിർദ്ദേശം രണ്ട് ഇതിനൊരു സാധ്യതയുണ്ട് കാരണം എന്ന് വെച്ചാൽ നേരത്തെ പറഞ്ഞതുപോലെ വളരെ ചുരുങ്ങിക്കൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്ന മറൈൻ ലാൻഡിങ്സിനെ നമുക്ക് എങ്ങനെയാണ് നമുക്ക് അത് ഒരു സസ്റ്റൈനബിൾ ഫിഷറി എന്നുള്ള നിലയിൽ അതിൻ്റെ റിസോഴ്സസിനെ കൺസർവ് ചെയ്യാൻ കഴിയും ഇവിടെ കൃത്യമായിട്ട് ചാൾസ് ചൂണ്ടിക്കാണിച്ചതുപോലെ നമുക്കുടെ നമ്മളുടെ ഒരു ഡെൻസിറ്റി എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് വളരെ വലുതാണ് ഈ ഓവർ കപ്പാസിറ്റി എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് അപ്പൊ നമുക്കതിനെ എങ്ങനെയാണ് അതിനെ ചുരുക്കാൻ കഴിയുക അത് ജോൺ കുര്യൻ സാറിന് ചൂണ്ടിക്കാണിക്കുന്നത് അപ്പൊ നമുക്ക് അതിനെ കൃത്യമായി അക്വറിയ റിഫോംസ് എന്ന് നമ്മൾ വളരെ കൃത്യമായി കണ്ടിരുന്ന അത് കേരളത്തിൽ നിന്നാണ് ആ ഒരു ഇനിഷ്യേറ്റീവ് വന്നിട്ടുണ്ടായിരുന്നത് രണ്ട് ഘട്ടങ്ങളിലായി എന്നോട് ഡോക്ടർ രവീന്ദ്രന്റെ നേതൃത്വത്തിലുള്ള കമ്മിറ്റിയുടെ റിപ്പോർട്ട് നമ്മുടെ കയ്യിലുണ്ട് തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും അത്തരത്തിൽ ഒരു അക്വറിയ റിഫോംസിനെ കുറിച്ച് കൃത്യമായി ആലോചിക്കുന്നതിനും ഇതിനെ പ്രയോജനപ്പെടുത്താൻ കഴിയുമോ എന്ന് നോക്കേണ്ടതായി അപ്പൊ അത്തരത്തിലൊരു അക്വറിയ റിഫോംസിലേക്ക് പോകാൻ കൺസർവേഷൻ സാധ്യമാക്കാൻ കൺസർവേഷൻ ആവശ്യമായിട്ട് ഈ പറഞ്ഞ പോലെ സബ്സിഡി കമ്പോണൻറ്റിനെ ഉപയോഗപ്പെടുത്തിക്കൊണ്ട് വലിയ തോതിൽ ഇതിനകത്ത് നിൽക്കുന്ന വെസലുകൾ നമുക്ക് ഈ പറഞ്ഞ പോലെ തിരിച്ചെടുക്കാം ജോൺ കുര്യൻ സാർ പറഞ്ഞതുപോലെ അതിനെ ഒരു ആ രൂപത്തിലേക്ക് തിരിച്ചെടുക്കാൻ കഴിയുകയാണെന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും നമ്മുടെ ഈ റിസോഴ്സസിന്റെ ലാൻഡിങ്സും വർദ്ധിക്കും അങ്ങനെ വർദ്ധിക്കും ഇപ്പൊ നമ്മൾ നേരത്തെ പറഞ്ഞ ട്രോൾ ബാൻഡ് പോലുള്ള റിസോഴ്സ് കൺസർവേഷൻ മെഷേഴ്സ് ഈ പറഞ്ഞത് ഓവർ ഫിഷിംഗ് ഒഴിവാക്കുകയാണെന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ നമുക്ക് കൂടുതൽ ലാൻഡിങ്സ് വരുന്ന സാധ്യതയിലേക്ക് പോകും പിന്നെ ഒരു കാര്യം നമുക്ക് ഇതിനെ വളരെ കൃത്യമായി വരേണ്ടത് നമ്മളുടെ എക്സ്പോർട്ടിന് കഴിയുന്ന നിലയിലേക്ക് നമ്മുടെ പിടിക്കപ്പെട്ട് വരുന്ന റിസോഴ്സസിന് വാല്യൂ അഡിഷനിൽ പിടിക്കുന്ന മത്സ്യത്തൊഴിലാളികൾക്ക് ഒരു ബെനിഫിറ്റും ഇല്ല എന്നുള്ളതാണ് ഇന്നത്തെ ആ വാല്യൂ അഡിഷൻ മത്സ്യത്തൊഴിലാളികളുടെയും കൂടെ കോപ്പറേറ്റീവ്സ് വഴി ചെയ്യുകയാണെന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ ഈ പിടിക്കുന്ന മത്സ്യത്തൊഴിലാളികൾക്ക് അതിന്റെ പ്രയോജനം കിട്ടും അപ്പൊ അവിടെയും കോപ്പറേറ്റൈസ് ചെയ്യുക എന്നുള്ളതും മത്സ്യത്തൊഴിലാളികൾക്ക് വാല്യൂ അഡിഷന്റെ ഗുണം കിട്ടുക എന്നുള്ള നിലയിലേക്ക് ഈ ചർച്ചയെ കൊണ്ടുപോകാൻ കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ നന്നായിരിക്കും വളരെ പ്രധാനം ഈ നേരത്തെ പറഞ്ഞതുപോലെ ഇതിനെ ഒരു ഗവൺമെന്റ് ഓഫ് ഇന്ത്യ സെൻസിറ്റൈസ്ഡ് അല്ല എന്നുള്ളതാണ് ഇതിന്റെ ഏറ്റവും പ്രധാനപ്പെട്ട ഘടകം അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ബ്ലൂ ബ്ലൂ എക്കണമി പോലെയുള്ള ഒരു ഗൈഡ് ലൈൻ നമ്മുടെ മുമ്പിലേക്ക് വരത്തില്ലായിരുന്നു അപ്പൊ ഗവൺമെന്റ് ഓഫ് ഇന്ത്യയെ സെൻസിറ്റൈസ് ചെയ്യാൻ ഈ പറഞ്ഞ ചർച്ച നേരത്തെ പറഞ്ഞതുപോലെ വലിയ തോതിൽ ഈ ചർച്ചയിലേക്ക് പോകാൻ ഈ നമ്മുടെ കേരളത്തിലെങ്കിലും കഴിയുന്നത് ഈ പറഞ്ഞ രണ്ട് എഡിറ്റോറിയലുകൾ ഒരു പക്ഷെ ഈ കാര്യത്തിൽ സെൻസിറ്റൈസ് ചെയ്തതുപോലെ മത്സ്യത്തൊഴിലാളികളെ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ മത്സ്യമേഖലയിൽ നിൽക്കുന്ന സംഘടനകളുടെ കൂട്ടായ്മ ഗവൺമെന്റ് ഓഫ് ഇന്ത്യയെ ഈ കാര്യത്തിൽ സെൻസിറ്റൈസ് ചെയ്യാൻ കഴിയുന്ന നിലയിലേക്ക് വലിയ
പ്രൊഫസർ കേൾക്കാമോ പ്രൊഫസർ ഹരിലാൽ കേൾക്കാമോ ഓക്കെ തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും ശ്രീ സെബാസ് മാത്യുവിൻ്റെയും അതുപോലെ തന്നെ ഡോക്ടർ ജോൺ ഗുരിയൻ്റെയും അവതരണങ്ങൾ ഇതിനെക്കുറിച്ച് ഒരു വെളിച്ചം വീശുന്ന രീതിയിൽ നന്നായിട്ടുണ്ട് പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ഒരു മാക്രോ പിക്ചർ Uh, I know I am Tito. I am actually 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 hearing fishing village here in ഡെവലപ്പിംഗ് കൺട്രീസ് fishing scenario and the subsidy regime actually it is uh, an interesting um, session to watch from them and hear from them and i am just uh, putting my uh, i mean uh, suggestion certain micro level aspects particularly on say multifold than kerala see uh, multifold is one of the cooperative which provide all most of the subsidies which, uh, it is channelizing through the traditional fish work is mostly you know when coming to the scenario of fisheries of kerala we we can see that see ring seen which is a mini pearl seen uh, which contribute uh, the major share of the kerala's fish production if we consider the regime pattern as uh, proposed these major uh, f- fishing tactics may be illegal because uh, due to uh, as per the uh, i mean uh, framework what they suggested because they are they are doing overfishing they are doing uh, the juvenile fishing so they are may not be eligible to get the subsidies anymore as per the new agreement uh, on the other hand it is good that because there are a big in number more in number they are doing the overfishing and uh, as uh, jo- uh, sebastian matthew pointed out there is an opportunity to control them but ultimately the source whatever they are getting they are going to be uh, lose it also again what i feel is the subsidy regime and discussion is not a much impact on or it, uh, we cannot i mean find this is an opportunity to uh, regulate or manage our uh, fish resources it, it, it is not seen as an effective tool to manage the fishing scenario of kerala because even the subsidies are also giving a say some 10 or 20 percentage of the uh, fishing fleet in kerala the rest they are operating by their own so how we can find this as an opportunity to manage this uh, that is one point another thing is of course whatever they are getting there is subsidy for the fishing net yes fishing boats yes outboard engine yes nearly some 30 for uh, 30 to 40 percent of the total cost Uh, they are uh, i mean managed through subsidies by the beneficiaries of the cooperatives but they are only some 10 to 15% of the total uh, fishing force in kerala so i don't feel it is a major fa- tool to manage as uh, dr sebastian matthew emphasized in particularly in kerala of course it is a uh, it is a good academic exercise or so we can be do some good academic work and also it can be treated as an effective tool to address the overfishing and the fisheries management issue but the most the, the other issue as uh, actually vijayan pointed out see we should come to Dr. the Vito, uh, what is happening uh, you, i unfortunately you have to conclude because uh, we are running out of uh, time uh, you are making very interesting points thank you for those points but uh, okay thank you thank you thank you thank you yeah. happy here yeah. did it time concern okay thank you thank you thank you thank you to give uh, i think i should now give opportunity to sitar chakravarti because he has already uh, written two uh, questions in the chat box he is still continuing uh, he is present why don't you why don't you sitar chakravarti why don't you raise your question uh thanks professor harilal i think i think i in the interest of time and given that you there's a discussion in the presenters as well 
I mean, I've written my questions in the chat, and those are pretty much that I wanted to post. If they can be uh, responded to, or if they are part of the discussion, I'd be happy to. I don't. I wouldn't take up more time to kind of speak because there's definitely more important points that can come in. So I'll leave them in the chat for maybe anybody who can take a look at them. And no, I think you know you, uh, you can you can read out you, read out your points. That will be useful for the participants in general. Okay. Okay. If you. Uh, no, my point was kind of related to the idea that was brought together by different speakers today. One was kind of just placing that India's position is perhaps unique uh, in the sense that while the fisheries production from a lot of the developing countries is a majority share globally, uh, countries like China and Indonesia might see a lot of their domestic capital actually fishing in high seas or other EZs. While a lot of other EZs like Peru, etc., might see other foreign capital coming into their EZs. And in that sense, we perhaps are an outlier as a country that we do not have either large domestic capital in other EZs or ABNJs or foreign capital in the Indian EZ. And so thinking about when it comes to the substantive negotiations, what whether it would hamper India's position in the sense that there would be struggles between capitals when it comes to these negotiations and how that would play out domestically, which is linked to the second question, which is that what is the vision that we then have um, in terms of building avenues? I'm not saying we should have a vision, but perhaps, you know, we see uh, in the discussions by people from the fishing community today, there is again a heterogeneous kind of nature of where fishing is happening, what kind of fishing is happening. We had a delegation from India at Geneva which spoke very differently and then we have the IMF bill, which is also marred in the definitions of SSFs and regional kind of takes on what the bill's content should be. So in, in terms of that heterogeneity existing, uh, just kind of the question is, what are the opportunities on the ecology, if social ecology of livelihoods is very deeply tied together, then the subsidies is an avenue to talk about subsidies towards what, perhaps. And that what vision, I think, has been missing, at least during the whole Geneva round from a lot of the conversation related to fisher groups. So my question was, where are those avenues possible to have that conversation? Um, and the third thing is a technical question, which is that what are going to be the mechanisms of actually dispute resolution, where the trade of fish, of course, as John Kurian said, it's hard to catch, but also the markets are diverse, where domestic markets, fish feed markets, overseas markets are tied together. And so when does it enter the trade dispute mechanism for India breaching, but that's far into the distance, but I just wanted to kind of post that as well. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Siddharth. Now I think you know, we'll have to uh, give some time to the uh, the, the presenters, Professor Bishwajit and uh, Sebastian Matthew. Can you take uh, five minutes each and then uh, respond? Maybe slightly more than that, but then uh, it's already 12.30. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you. Thank you, Harilal. In fact, I don't have much time. I have to leave pretty soon. So I also uh, try and uh, put my responses quickly. You know, this is a very interesting discussion we had today. And I think uh, if this discussion had happened before we had signed this agreement, it would have been much better. Yeah? Because, I, you know, I'm fundamentally opposed to uh, the argument that WTO is going to reform our laws. I don't think that is politically acceptable to me at all. I don't think many of us will be rejecting that position. Uh, I've heard it many times that, you know, that, uh, <laughs> that, that WTO agreements can do this job for us because we, since we can't handle our domestic issues, let a, you know, uh, you know, sort of um, the intergovernmental agency come and do that. So that, that, is, that is exactly what happened when the Washington consensus was thrust on us. And I don't think uh, any, any one of us uh, needs reminding as to what happened. Now, uh, so I think uh, these uh, issues, and again, I'm pretty disappointed, I must say, that I've been hearing these discussions about how to really focus on conservation for the past 30 years, uh, you know, since uh, even before the negotiations began. Uh, and and now you know we come and say that you know WTO is going to help us do that, 
and we know what WTO does, you know, and we, and and not just you know WTO doesn't do it. I, I'm sorry to say that it, it's actually the developed countries who do this. Yeah. Recently, there is a uh, there was a, a paper, uh, sorry, letter written by a bunch of twelve congressmen, most of them representing the agribusiness, uh, to uh, President Biden. Uh, they wrote a letter to President Biden saying that Indian, you know, the subsidies that India gives to rice and wheat are completely WTO illegal, and in, and WTO and WTO should take India to the cleaners. Yeah, uh, and and you know, you know, so we have been facing these kinds of disputes in the WTO uh, on agriculture, left, right, and center. Uh, uh, and I actually wrote a response to that in the Wire, which got published yesterday. Uh, so. Uh, now, I mean, we know the nature of the beast, uh, and I don't think that we can really expect the developed countries to give us any room uh, to do what, uh, you know, Professor Korean very correctly mentioned that we need to do, or, or, or Mr. Saristin mentioned that we need to do all these things. There is absolutely no uh, two opinions about it. Of course, Mr. Saristin's point that we do not need a CVDR, I have a serious problem with that. And I think the response to that was given by uh, Professor Turin himself when he said that, you know, developed countries have been subsidizing their, uh, their fish, the fisheries sector so heavily. Even today, uh, there is a huge amount of subsidies coming in. And I don't think, uh, you know, uh, we should make a case for kicking out CBDR under any circumstances. And, and we know what happens uh, here that if, if we say that in fisheries, we don't need CBDR, then we would not need CBDR for ad addressing any of our environmental problems. Uh, all the climate change issues, the CBDR will be uh, will be just gone. So I think we need to be very careful as to what we say in terms of you know uh, our uh, arguments. Now uh, 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 um, um, I liked uh, uh, you know Mr. Uh, Professor Kurian's points uh, uh, um, uh, immensely in the sense that the kind of uh, you know um, uh, issues he raised. Uh, he was speculating whether there were opportunities, uh, so whether uh, the, the fishery subsidies was a bargaining chip for, for other agreements. Now, again, on the bargaining issue, uh, let, let me uh, remind uh, many of you would know that, that agriculture became the biggest bargaining chip for us in the Urugaram negotiations. We thought that developed countries will kick out all the subsidies. And here we are going to get access to the markets which we have been trying for the past 50 years. It never happened. Yeah. Then the second point is said that uh, uh, you know um, uh, this uh, agreement will help in conservation. Now again, we have heard this agreement, uh, this argument that the trips agreement will help in uh, in in hastening our uh, our putting in place our innovation system. It doesn't happen. I think the entire change will have to take place internally. We need to actually uh, get our act together. And, and from what I heard today was that we do not, we haven't actually got our act together. We, I think we are just hoping for all kinds of, uh, you know, sort of putting all the elements together uh, and, and trying to uh, develop a kind of a, a policy package and the instruments they are under to really address all the critical problems that the fishery sector is, is, is facing. Now, when we are in that situation, what we have been arguing all the time is that we need the policy space. We don't want to be sort of gagged by the WTO and you know the advanced countries uh, to come and say that look, you do not have the policy space to do this. So I think you know I I, I got up and and and, and Sridhar made a very important point. I think that there was no discussion in public domain. Uh, there wasn't any discussion. I was, I was absolutely so, uh, and I think we need to uh, better late than never. We need to have this. How are you? And I can't tell you. Sorry. So we need to have this discussion. Let us put our heads together to see what kind of a framework we need, and and let us do it quickly because uh, I think we need to plug in into these negotiations in the next two three years. Four years is way down the uh, way way down the the the, the, pipe, the pipeline, and let's see. And I don't think, and and my experience of negotiating in WTO tells me very clearly, is going to be a rocky ride, unless we get all our facts together, 
all our framework together. It is not going to be uh, easy, an easy ride. Whatever we are thinking that we are going to be getting out of this agreement is just going to be falling flat. So I just wanted to end on a note of caution, knowing the the the, the what the nature of the beast uh, is going to be a problematic. And then the whole issue of dispute settlement. Dispute settlement is going to be the uh, the usual WTO dispute settlement uh, uh, you know uh, framework. And if anyone wants to see what the dispute settlement uh, uh, body can do, what the panel can do, you, you should actually go back and uh, go and read the uh, the sugar subsidies dispute that we had with Australia, Guatemala, and and Brazil, and then 13 other countries as third parties, and see what kind of ridiculous arguments the uh, the panel was making uh, against India subsidies. Yeah, I don't think they had any legs to stand on, but they made it, and and that has become uh, a part of the. Uh, the the jurisprudence of the WTO. So uh, I, I'll stop here. Uh, thank you again for giving me this opportunity, uh, 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 Professor Sunil Mani and Professor Harilal. I won't have the time to actually sit through the entire thing, but uh, if there are any other discussions in future, uh, please count me in. I'll be very happy to join. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Vishwath. Uh, we'll be uh, making some efforts to follow up this discussion. We'll uh, certainly be in touch with you. Now, uh, uh, Sri Sebastian Matthew to respond. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Harlal. I think uh, first I would like to uh, respond to uh, Bishwaj's point uh, about uh, uh, common but differentiated responsibility. See, the, my argument is based on the principle that marine uh, fisheries resources are different from resources within the sovereignty space. Because uh, uh, we got the Law of the Sea Convention in 1982 uh, and uh, we declared Maritime Zones of India Act in 1977. So therefore, uh, only after 1977, uh, so to speak, we have a 200 mile exclusive economic zone, which is actually a, a gift from the international community. So therefore, the uh, between the territorial sea and the, and the uh, EEZ boundary, that is actually a, a gift from the uh, from uh, international community to coastal states. So therefore, uh, coastal seas do not have sovereignty to EEZ. They have only sovereignty to the territorial sea. So therefore, we have to see marine capture fisheries in the EEZ different from uh, inland fisheries or even in the territorial sea, for the argument's sake. So therefore, uh, 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 under that responsibility of, uh, arising from uh, ratifying the Law of the Sea Convention 1982, very few countries have lived up to the conservation management obligations uh, of the flag state or the coastal state. Uh, so these are uh, uh, lagging far behind, and this is uh, an opportunity to take it forward. And all attempts at uh, at uh, uh, reminding uh, coastal states of their duties have not really uh, uh, been taken seriously. Like uh, from 2004 onwards, for example, India has been trying to develop a Marine Fisheries Act for the EZ from 2004. We have been part of so many discussions. We have seen so many drafts. Uh, nothing has happened. But we have uh, an act for the foreign fishing in the EZ uh, from 1978. See, that could have been easily amended for the EZ uh, very, very, very conveniently because there is a legal instrument which can be adapted also to serve the uh, vessels registered by the coastal state. So that we have not done. Therefore, uh, Fisheries is only 1% of GDP. We never get any policy space. Uh, most of the decisions are taking the interests of other sectors into consideration. And fishery has not uh, got the deserving uh, policy space uh, from uh, ever since we ratified that uh, he said, he said uh, legislation. So that's the reason why we feel that this agreement uh, can be a catalyst. So we use the word catalyst. We didn't say that WTO has to uh, manage fisheries, but WTO instrument can be used to uh, uh, play the standards and and that context I I I can see that the overall uh, sentiments of uh, people who spoke uh, during this discussion uh, was uh, in support of conservation management. So I think uh, there is uh, there is a, a role for developing countries to take the lead now. Not to say that we still need a differentiated responsibility because we have already fully exploited our resources. So therefore, there is a uh, there isn't much resources that we are going to develop with uh, you know uh, additional kind of investment into resources. Of course, uh, in the value addition, I agree there is a lot more options in aquaculture. Maybe there are a lot of things can happen, 
But in capture fisheries, you know, we have reached a, a ceiling from 1994 onwards. The world has not increased production. Even China, look at uh, uh, the most recent uh, state of world fisheries and aquaculture. They are drastically reducing their fishing effort. A number of vessels are uh, they cutting down by 10 or 20 percent. EU is cutting down its fishing fleet. So therefore, I think uh, developing countries have to uh, take a common responsibility. So not differentiated. The common responsibility for the marine resources should be a a universal act where we all join hands together and based on various instruments where civil society organizations have also played a very active role from both developed and developing countries. So therefore, I think conservation management can definitely pay dividends. Uh, and then, of course, when it comes to uh, subsidies, like the issues which raised here, I think many of the subsidies, rebuilding stocks are permitted under the existing agreement. Nobody is going to challenge that. Uh, but unfortunately, that uh, a UU fishing uh, appellation will be uh, put on uh, on small tuna boats going into Seychelles and uh, you know British Indian Ocean territory. I mean that why? Because there is no authorization mechanism available to these boats before they fish outside the EZ. So we can actually address uh, their fishing interests by bringing in a legislation that talks about. Uh, recognizing uh, how to authorize these vessels to fish outside. So we can actually do that. And uh, when it comes to fuel subsidies, uh, I mean, uh, how are the countries like US and EU giving subsidies? They don't even call it subsidies. They call it, uh, you know, they have a different uh, pricing mechanism for uh, tractors, for fishing vessels, for shipping vessels, uh, because they are all for non-road use of uh, these, these vessels. So these vessels are not driving on the road. So therefore, I think uh, Sridhar mentioned about the road tax. I think somebody else, Basil, I think, mentioned about road tax. See, this kind of thing doesn't apply to uh, the maritime vessels, not to the tractors in a, in a farm. So therefore, e India can easily think of having a, a, a dual pricing policy, one for the road use where all the taxes will apply, and another for navigational use, for agricultural use, uh, where it is priced differently. You don't even call it subsidies. So these taxes, uh, you know, like uh, a carbon tax or uh, excise duty and customs duty and, uh, you know, uh, uh, road tax, all that will not apply to those type of uh, uh, operations. And there is uh, uh, an additional dimension of uh, safeties there. When fishing vessels are at sea, they need uh, uh, security and, and protection of their life at sea. So therefore, we need to also keep that in mind. Of course, then uh, at the same time, we can't give a blank check to fishing vessels. There is very important uh, to talk about conservation management. So if there is conservation management, I think some of these kind of uh, pricing policy can be adopted and uh, support uh, can be extended for responsible fishing operations by, by our fleet. So I think that's uh, how we have to go forward. And if you look at, again, uh, the subsidies given by uh, uh, some of the states, like, say, if you look at the Gujarat uh, demand for gra uh, grant 2022-23, uh, they are giving 337 crore uh, for the VAT exemption uh, for the vessels uh, in, uh, in Gujarat. But if you look at uh, Kerala, uh, kerosene is only 45. Uh, uh, 45 uh, crore, you know, that Kerala is giving in the latest uh, uh, demand for grant. And then uh, look at Gujarat. Wow, there are 10,000 OBMs in Kerala, 10,000 OBMs in Gujarat, you know, and Gujarat is giving uh, 10 uh, crore for the kerosene subsidies of uh, of the small vessels in Gujarat. So therefore, obviously, the, the largest share of the uh, subsidies that are currently extended are going to uh, uh, more larger vessels. And, and again, if you look at the over, overfishing type of, uh, you know, uh, impact in India, uh, Areas where a large number of bottom trawlers are working, you see greater uh, impact on 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 on, on overfishing, and then overfish stocks that are listed are mostly coming from areas where there are, there is a large preponderance of uh, bottom trawlers. So therefore, we can try to uh, look at all these issues and need to have some kind of a structural approach. So where there is a uh, underexploited, you know, fully uh, fully exploited or you know uh, managed fishery, uh, we can try to support in a certain way. And then where there is overexploited or a collapsed type of fisheries, you can try to rebuild the fish stocks. And like what John also mentioned earlier about, you know, buyback schemes. There's so many uh, 10 or 12 schemes one can think of to help those people to, you know, uh, come out of the fishery because the resources are overexploited. So therefore, there are ways of doing it. So we need to uh, design a, a kind of a, a financial support mechanism for the fishery sector, which is very coherent, which is uh, taking into account all the states, because as again, John mentioned, the fluidity of the sea and uh, mobility of resources. We need to have a, a, a coherent system for the EZ, 
uh, territorial sea uh, and then interstate movement of vessels and then even interstate boundaries. I think there is no boundary between uh, different states, although we talk about boundary between the territorial sea and the, and, and the EZ. Between the state, there is no boundary. These are all issues which many other countries have resolved, and we can resolve that as well. And then maybe uh, under the Indian Marine Fisheries Bill, there is a proposal to set up uh, fisheries management councils at the national level. Maybe, you know, uh, the whatever Charles mentioned about zonal to district to state level can be further, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, taken up to the level of, uh, you know, regions, uh, southern states, northern states. So I think there are a lot of uh, opportunity within that as well. So that is the, therefore the uh, the investment uh, can be made into resource conservation management uh, for uh, re for re rebuilding stocks and for resources which are underexploited. We can try to uh, have a different approach. And then when you give subsidies for them to develop fishery, for example, for that one million tuna that uh, Charles mentioned. We should try to make sure that they are complying with the conservation management mechanism framework. So therefore, I think some sort of a uh, balanced approach can be adopted. The last line I would like to say is that, you know, uh, Charles also mentioned mictophids. See, I think mictophid is the food for whales in the Arabian Sea. And it is a raw material uh, which people are trying to convert into raw material for fish meal, but it is not a food for people. So I don't think we should move into full commoditization of resources in the marine space. You know, so fishermen should catch fish for food security, not for reducing to uh, fish meal for you know, some kind of industrial raw material. So therefore, I think mitophid, we should be very careful. And we need to give space for conservation management. We need to give space for whales also. So we need to have a broader perspective of animals uh, and they are across the uh, a different trophic level, you know, the one uh, prey predator relationship, all that we, we need to respect. And we are also one of the predators on marine living resources. So we need to work out a system where everybody has a role. And then, and as a developing country, which has fairly large number of people you know, discussing fisheries issues, perhaps disproportionate to what you see in many other countries, we should try to get this uh, energy pool together and think of our future. You know, After 30 years time, we want to sit and talk about uh, a collapsed marine fisheries, which because of our neglect and you know, lack of attention. I think we can uh, certainly build up these talks with, uh, with kind of a more attentive and coherent approach. Yeah, thank you. Sorry to take too much time, yeah. Thank you, uh, Sebastian Matthew. Uh, I, I, I should thank all the participants, particularly uh, those who made the presentations and those who uh, participated in the discussion. I'm sure that you know, there are many other participants who wanted to raise uh, more points. And uh, now if you look uh, at the chat box, you now there are more, more questions coming up, but uh, we cannot afford to have more time discussing these issues. Uh, as a moderator, um, I would like to say a few words before uh, concluding the, uh, the session. Uh, from uh, today's discussion, one thing is very clear. This agreement on the fisheries agreement on subsidies, uh, this raises more questions than answers. Uh, this is what I felt when I read uh, this agreement uh, twice or thrice. Um, uh, in fact, no questions were coming up in my mind uh, with respect to different articles and sub clauses. And uh, that was uh, my hunch feeling. But then uh, today's discussion, uh, uh, in fact, raised many questions regarding this uh, agreement. Uh, some of the, 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 the points are very relevant uh, to be uh, highlighted, like uh, issue of non-specific uh, subsidies raised by uh, um, Bishidhar and uh, special treatment for developing countries. Now, that's a larger question. And uh, the kind of pressure that uh, the, the developed countries will be putting on uh, India in the future negotiations on this agreement. Uh, there are many such issues which were raised. I'm not uh, going to list out uh, those uh, issues which were raised. But uh, we should uh, underline this major point which is coming out out of this discussion. That is, you know, we are all for conservation of fisheries resources. There's a real danger that uh, 
the world as a whole is facing in this area. But uh, as uh, Bishud was, say, uh, was uh, saying, a subsidy specific agreement of the WTO uh, is not really going to solve this problem of conservation. That is a, that is a very ambitious uh, way of looking at it. But at the same time, we need to have policies and action to conserve resources. And uh, we should have a, a separate approach towards this particular agreement. Because as I was uh, telling which, about which I am very convinced, the compliance cost is going to be very, very, very high. And uh, if you are uh, falling short of expectations as far as compliance, then it can lead to disputes. And uh, disputes uh, will not be restricted to fisheries. Uh, the fact that some uh, some boats operating from Cochin, if they are not registered, if they are found to be illegal, uh, then if uh, the issue is uh, taken to the dispute settlement body, then uh, the, the cross retaliation can come in many other sectors, in agriculture, in services. That's how the dispute settlement mechanism of WTO is being used. Uh, so there are such many larger issues. Uh, I should also mention about uh, the question of subsidy raised by Sri Ajay Vijay and Basil Lal and all. Uh, we don't have a clear picture about subsidies. That's very clear from uh, today's discussion. Of course, now individual subsidies we know in the area of kerosene, uh, in the area of uh, you, know, uh, um, uh, you know, the kind of subsidies uh, people were mentioning about Malsia, Malsia for Dental. Dr. Tito was uh, listing out some of those subsidies. But uh, that is not enough for a, a WTO kind of negotiation or dispute settlement. We should probably have very detailed data on uh, subsidies that we are giving to find out uh, uh, how much we are actually giving. And uh, what about data on subsidies from other countries? In negotiating table, we need to know about subsidies in other countries, uh, our neighbors as well as uh, other participating countries. So there are many issues which will have to be pursued. So there should be research in this area. And uh, following the tradition of CDS, uh, uh, we should probably take up uh, research uh, in CDS, but uh, that will really require participation from scholars elsewhere, as well as uh, um, unions and uh, community organizations. Uh, I hope uh, that CDS uh, will uh, take up this very seriously. Many research scholars and uh, faculty members attended this, and uh, maybe you know they'll uh, take the uh, the message and uh, draw up uh, detailed research projects. With that, uh, let me conclude by again thanking all the all the participants. Thank you very much for participating in this seminar.